Hello and welcome. Very nice to have you back with us again for day two of our virtual conference. I enjoyed being with you very much yesterday and I'm pleased to be back with you again. Whether you're watching us in Southeast Asia or in Europe or anywhere else in the world, we're really glad that you could join us again. And we hope you're looking forward to the second part of our Agence Française de Développement, the AFD conference, which is called Southeast Asia's Challenges to Sustainable and Inclusive Development. My name is Rini Windham, and together with my colleague and good friend Karen Coleman, we have a packed program for you today with three roundtable discussions. Karen and I are both journalists, both former BBC presenters and moderators. Karen hails from Ireland and specialises in EU and international news. I live in both UK and France, where I am at the moment on another sunny day, and specialise in European affairs and environment for several European TV stations. We both look forward to spending the rest of this conference with you. Yesterday, we set the scene and looked at the challenges facing Southeast Asia in the face of climate change and how ASEAN and EU countries can work together to a more sustainable future. Today, we're looking at practical solutions. We'll look at how the public and private sectors can cooperate to promote energy transition in Southeast Asia. Then we'll focus specifically at the Mekong River and Delta and how to preserve biodiversity under the different pressures it's facing. Our final roundtable will look at the legal challenges and how to strengthen access to environmental justice in the region. On a more optimistic note, we'll be looking at the opportunities our current situation presents for more sustainable solutions and a levelling up across the different nations of Southeast Asia. Yesterday we had our first roundtable panel discussion, so now it's time to start roundtable two. I'll be back with you again in about 90 minutes time for roundtable three, but now I shall once more hand you over to set the scene to a very capable former BBC journalist, now senior moderator, my very good friend and colleague, Karen Coleman. Karen. Thank you very much, uh, Rini, and hello, everybody. You're all very welcome to this, the second day of uh, the conference. It's great to have you on board again. As Rini said, I'm a journalist and a broadcaster from Ireland, and I specialise in EU and international news. And unlike where Rini is in France, where it's warm and sunny, and perhaps where many of you are also based, I'm afraid it's chilly, uh, and wet here in Galway, in the west of Ireland, where I am based. Um, anyway, as Rini mentioned, we're going to now start our second roundtable discussion. And the question we're going to be exploring this session is, what kind of cooperation is needed between public and private sectors to promote the energy transition in Southeast Asia? And just to put that question into context, I'm sure many of you know this, energy transition is one of the sub-priorities of AFD's operation in Southeast Asia. And this transition, which has begun tentatively in a number of countries in the region, must not only allow for a gradual shift from fossil fuels to renewable energies, but it should also promote energy efficiency in the production sector, in buildings, and in electrical systems. And the scale of the challenges to be met requires the involvement of both the public and the private sectors. And cooperation between both these stakeholders is essential to remove the obstacles to investment. So, and of course, yesterday too, during the first round table debate, we heard a lot about the green transition and the need to address climate change challenges, including cleaner sources of energy. So over the next hour, we're going to hear now from our three expert panelists on this topic. And of course, we would love to hear from you during the session as well. If you do have questions, please submit them through the question channel on your live storm screen. We had lots of questions in yesterday, and it would be great again to see what you would like to 
put by way of questions to our panelists. But now it's my pleasure to introduce our three guests for this roundtable session. And can I gently remind all of you speakers to please stick to the allocated seven, max 10 minutes you've been given for your opening remarks to our generic question that I'm going to put to all of you. So our first speaker is Benny Suryadi. Benny is the manager of power, fossil fuels, alternative energy and storage at P PFS at the ASEAN Centre for Energy. It's an intergovernmental organisation within the ASEAN structure representing 10 ASEAN member states in the energy sector and it's leading energy and climate programmes to support those 10 ASEAN countries to accelerate their energy transitions. Good morning to you, Benny. You're very welcome to this roundtable session. And I'm going to start really by asking you again for your responses to this opening question that I referred to earlier. What kind of cooperation is needed between public and private sectors to promote the energy transition in Southeast Asia? Over to you, Benny. Thank you very much, Karen. And I say, uh... Good afternoon from Jakarta. And thank you very much for your kind introduction. And as being introduced, uh, I am from the ASEAN Center for Energy. Um, we are uh, represent the interests of the 10 countries in the Southeast Asia region on the energy uh, cooperation. And before I start with my topic, allow me to also convey my highest appreciation to FD for inviting me to this important event uh, where the topic is very much in line with the directive and goals uh, that we have at regional level through our regional blueprint, the ASEAN Plan of Action for Energy Cooperation that was endorsed by the ASEAN Minister on Energy uh, Meeting. And uh, referring to the topic, uh, the question that Karen addressed, on what cooperation between private and the public sector for promoting the energy transition in ASEAN or the Southeast Asia. I would like to kick off the discussion by sharing with you on the latest development on the power sector. Definitely energy sector is way more beyond the power sectors only, uh, but indeed uh, it gives the insight on what is happening in the region. So my slide is referring to our, one of our latest publication the ASEAN power updates that we have released uh, last month. Last year, when the world was scrambling with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, 10 countries in the Southeast Asia region added cumulatively around 22 gigawatt new installed power capacity. So make it a total now become around 285. And about 82% of this new capacity is in, in 2020 was renewable. So this is quite a notable new trend for the region. For the last five years, the installed fossil fuel capacity compared to the renewable is, we can say is quite comparable, uh, but now the country in this region are not looking more toward renewable. Uh, Vietnam solar power greatly expand, uh, Thailand's and the Philippine winds power climbs, and Laos also created a new hydro capacity, which is not only for its domestic use, but also uh, for region. And many power projects took off in 2020, last year, setting a various record. Uh, solar project, of course, dominated, uh, continuously breaking new capacity record, while most of the fossil fuel power plants were in completion of the long state uh, plant projects. Looking to this slide, uh, not all listed here, but many projects are the true example of the partnership or cooperation between the public sector and the private sector in the Southeast Asia region. For example, 260 megawatt hydropower plant in Dong Sahong, Laos. Um, where the, the, the companies announced last November, uh, November last year, that it received a certificate from the Ministry of Energy and Mines of Laos confirming the commercial operation of the hydropower projects. Uh, the hydropower project itself is owned by Malaysian private entity. Another example is the Thailand largest uh, floating solar power plant in Ubud, uh, Ratanari, Thailand 
which was connected to the grid last year. That the private Thai energy producer who owns and operates this floating solar power and also in various locations sell electricity under 25 contract with the public entity, provincial electricity authorities. And looking to the current power development plan of the 10 countries in this region, more than 60% of the newly installed capacity, at least until 2025, will be coming from renewable, be it from solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, and other type of renewable. While the remaining will coming from the traditional hydrocarbon, as several countries are also already planning to have additional capacity coming from coal and, and natural gas. Uh, part of this energy transition, substantial power sector investment are required. From our estimation uh, in our study in ACE, uh, between 2018 and 2025, the needed investment is around 283 and the 367 uh, billion USD. Or in the longer term, until 2040, it will require around 500 to 600 billion uh, USD. This is where the partnership and cooperation between private sector and public sector become more and more uh, core crucial. And for example, in this year, we continuously the growing partnership between uh, the two sides, between the public side and, uh, and private uh, sides. Um, my slide is uh, more on the power sector, uh, but of course we can also see, see clearly as well the cooperation between the private sector and public sector in another energy sector. Um, simply saying, for example, energy efficiency uh, as a way to promote sustainable uh, growth in the face of growing energy demand in region. And we also uh, have, I can see such effort uh, to, to, to harness the energy efficiency uh, require comprehensive collaboration for all parties, including energy uh, service company. So this is kind of another example where the partnership between the private and public sector has become more crucial. Uh, the private sector is often considered to provide a greater efficiency. I, we can say that way than the, compare the public sector when managing infrastructure project and delivering uh, infrastructure service. So by investing in new technology, bringing innovative solution and encouraging more transparent organization uh, structure, uh, the private sector has a potential to improve operational efficiency as well as asset and service quality, and in turn, uh, supporting the government efforts to uh, accelerate the energy transition in the region. So I stop here and happy to have a follow-up discussion later. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, uh, Benny. So lots of interesting questions, I think, that people will put, uh, would like to put to you about some of the points you've made there. So Benny will be staying with us for the entire hour. Uh, thank you, Benny, for that. Now, let me introduce our next speaker. Sirpa Jarvenpa, I hope I pronounced it correctly, uh, Sirpa, is the director of the Southeast Asian Energy Transition Partnership at UNOPS, UNOPS. The ETP brings together government donors, philanthropies and Southeast Asian governments to accelerate energy transitions in the region. So Sirpa, over to you for your responses to that opening question, the topic of Roundtable 2. Good afternoon, Karen, and good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Um, and congratulations to AFD for the Southeast Asian uh, Seminar on Challenges to Sustainable and Inclusive Development. Um, Karen, would you kindly put my slides on? So I'll go right away into the presentation. So it's my pleasure to meet with you. My name is Sirpa, Sirpa Yervenpa, and I'm director of the Southeast Asian Energy Transition Partnership. And as Karen said, the partnership is already uh, a collaboration between private and public sectors. So as you mentioned, Karen, uh, the me government members include uh, governments of France, uh, represented by AFD, also uh, United Kingdom, Canada and Germany, and then a big number of uh, philanthropic uh, supporters, members such as uh, Children's Investment Fund Foundation, IKEA Foundation, Sequoia Climate Fund, and many others. Um, 
Karen, the way that the Energy Transition Partnership came to be in was really President Macron's suggestion a few years ago when he thought that we need to bring philanthropies together with governments, that is to say private and public parties, to resolve some of the global most pressing issues, one of them being energy transition. And uh, on the sidelines of these important global meetings, the partners hammered out a joint collaboration agreement and decided that uh, ETP should have a five-year term and its priority countries should be Indonesia, Philippines and Vietnam because of their rapidly growing energy demand and opportunities to transit directly to renewable energy to clean energy scenarios, which uh, Pabeni just mentioned. So the ultimate ambition uh, that the ETP has set for its own mandate is to enable the countries to achieve the, the sustainable development goals of the UN as well as the Paris climate goals to enable these countries to contribute to the Paris climate goals. So uh, what is really going on is that this year in November, the countries are coming back five years after agreeing to their nationally uh, determined contributions in terms of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And these reductions are given in this slide. Um, some of them are conditional to international support and that's when we come to this uh, discussion about private public partnership when we look at the numbers also papeni mentioned them some 500 600 billion prior to um, the 2030 deadline for achieving these nationally determined contributions we really definitely need public and private funders to come together to support these countries on their ambition um, what is this ambition about then, though? Um, what we know from science is that some 50-60% um, of, this, uh, of these greenhouse gases are generated by the, the um, energy se sectors. And because uh, such a large share of the energy sectors are still fueled by fossil fuels and coal, especially here in Southeast Asia, um, what is really critical is that we develop a coherent energy trans transition roadmap to the renewables. So ETP has set itself to, to uh, establish the broader framework for how do we do energy transition in Southeast Asia. So first of all, we need to establish policy coherency with these climate targets. We need to have one roadmap that all partners, private or public, can buy into and can begin to support that aim at one set of targets. We also need to acknowledge that these economies are highly dependent on fossil and coal for uh, energy production. And uh, in some cases, it is necessary to look into the decommissioning of some of the polluting plants and to then also look at the implications of such decommissioning on the communities that are reliant on for their income on these, on these facilities. So that process we call just transitioning, just in a sense of a fair transitioning process. Uh, one of the major impediments to energy transition is the grid technology, which is largely outdated, mostly built in the 90s in the region, and is not able to integrate variable renewable energy, such as the wind when the wind blows or sun when the sun shines into the consumption through the grid network. And then finally, um, uh, but then you also mentioned that we need to pay attention to how much energy we are actually using by various facilities, industry, households, re households and small businesses, government, um, and improve the energy intensity of the economy by implementing energy efficiency investments. And underpinning all of this is really the knowledge, knowledge, skills and awareness. We are looking to the civil society to, de to demand energy transition, cleaner environments, more clean jobs and greater uh, opportunities to diversify economies. And we also need the funding, funding from both private and public sources. So at ATP, we want to try to make sense of all these uh, uh, demands uh, that energy transition places on all of us and cluster them first outcome area that we are seeking is strengthening the enabling policies, strengthening the policy environment and ensuring its alignment with those climate goals. Also to increase the investments, um, to de-risk investment um, uh, frameworks and financing uh, 
uh, in um, concepts so that the investment will flow into renewable energy sources and energy efficiency projects. We need to be able to finance the digital technologies to extend what we are calling smart grids, grids that can in real time integrate the variable renewable energy into consumption. And then we talked about already the capacity and knowledge development. Knowledge gaps exist in all segments of the stakeholders, policymakers, all the way down to the civil society, including private sector, the academia, the think tank sector, and, and uh, uh, various other suppliers and deploy, uh, deployers of uh, renewable energy. But what is really critical in achieving this uh, kind of roadmap from the inputs where we talk about capacity building and money into various policy interventions and, and projects to the actual goals of reduced greenhouse gases is the political will, is the government's leadership in uh, ensuring that the policy uh, framework is very determined so shows its um, its uh, bold uh, stance to and determination to uh, make good on those climate commitments. And what I would like to say here is that each of these uh, roadmaps uh, within the policy sector, the increased investments and de-risking and modernizing power grids, and also the knowledge. A call for their own projects. And here again, we are looking to integrating private and public partners. So ETP, for instance, is reviewing opportunities to abate the coal um, power generation pipeline in uh, countries like Vietnam, as well as in Indonesia. We have developed a call for uh, efficiency projects, innovative efficiency projects that are just missing a little bit of assistance that we could provide in grant terms, whether it is uh, consolidating uh, projects to aggregated um, a larger investment opportunity or whether it's uh, investment grade audits uh, of uh, energy savings in buildings, as you mentioned, Karen. We are developing projects in all these domains. In Indonesia, we are starting a detailed design for the Java Bali control center that provides uh, uh, electricity for some 100 million people. And we also are launching a round table, which is something like a regional executive MBA program on uh, for practitioners in energy transition to learn about the concepts that have worked elsewhere in the world. Um, now, importantly, if we go deeper into the uh, various areas that we need to look into, I mentioned already that government's willpower and political will is really critical, as well as uh, um, everyone sort of buying into one roadmap. And uh, we also look to the governments to set up a champion in uh, interagency role that marshals in the inputs and resources to the energy transition. Um, another critical area that I want to point to in getting started with the policy dialogue is really to review the uh, what we call uh, the level playing field, meaning that are all technologies uh, really created equal in a sense that uh, in many countries the government still do subsidize the fossil fuel uh, power generation and we need to review these subsidies, we need to carry out those reforms and make sure that we also integrate something like polluter pays type philosophies in the pricing mechanisms so that you know where polluting um, energy generation is uh, conducted these um, pricing scenarios in incorporate something like carbon tax or carbon pricing in order to make it possible for cleaning of the environment um, subsequently uh, in terms of funding uh, policy alignment, we have lots and lots of partners. So while the the uh, the funding scenario, the fund, the numbers, the figures required for policy adjustments are very daunting, there is a lot of eager financiers. Of course, AFD is one of them. ETP uh, will provide technical assistance, and many other partners partners listed in that in that slide are, are eager to get to work. Um, in terms of uh, de-risking investments for energy efficiency and renewables, we have a deck of uh, uh, opportunities to tap into funding from private sector, but also from the public sector partners. In terms of extending smart grids, once again, uh, we are all in it together. We all want to be party and support our 
uh, countries, Indonesia, Philippines and Vietnam and others in the region to extend the digital technologies, to extend the smart grid so that the variable renewable energy can actually go into consumption. And finally, in terms of the knowledge, and here I want to emphasize not only developing um, the knowledge and bridging the knowledge gaps among the policymakers, the private sector parties, um, the various think tanks, but the civil society, in order to allow the civil society members and communities that are standing to be affected by this, the energy transition to, to be able to participate constructively in the dialogue and be aware of the issues as well as to be um, a party to designing the support programs, they need just transition engagements and uh, uh, training programs. So again, uh, my point here is that there is a lots of parties around the table who are ready to finance and support programs like that. And we at ETP are one of them. Um, we see this uh, sort of a tree of uh, reaching the, the noble goals of reduction of uh, uh, greenhouse gases through integration of increased deployment of renewable energy and energy efficiency investments into these economies through strengthening of the policy environment, through decreasing the barriers to financing public and private investment into renewable energy and energy efficiency, um, through integrating digital technologies to extend smart grids and increasing the knowledge and um, awareness development to generate those outcomes. So why a new energy transition partnership, given that there are so many other entities? Well, let me just say, um, working together... Sirpa, if you can just um, maybe I'll wrap up in 30 seconds, up. Karen. Great. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the the re reduced transaction costs are very uh, prominent uh, feature in working together. A small dedicated secretariat that will develop both technical assistance programs um, the UN transparency and neutrality that gives you competitive prices and processes in, uh, in um, implementing multi-stakeholder uh, and stronger voice in uh, influencing uh, the energy transition going forward. So here I want to thank everyone and thank you, Karen, for that extra 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, thank you. Brilliant uh, summary there, Serpa. Lots, I think, of questions to be answered about some of the points that you make. Some already are being reflected in our uh, question channel coming through from our listeners and attendees viewing and watching us online. And for those of you who have joined since we started, you're all very welcome to the conference. I'm Karen Coleman. I'm a journalist and a broadcaster from Ireland, and it's my pleasure to be moderating this second roundtable debate of the conference. Please do submit your questions for our three speakers. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible. But now let me go to our final panelist. Raphael de Guerre is the regional director for North and Southeast Asia with Proparco, and Proparco is the private sector financing arm of the Agent France de Development Group, AFD Group. It's been promoting sustainable, economic, social and environmental development for over 40 years. And Proparco's Southeast and North Asian regional office is based in Bangkok. Hello to you, Raphael. You're very welcome. And again, your responses, please, to the topic of our roundtable debate. I'll hand over to you now. Good afternoon, Karen. Thank you very much for, uh, for the introduction. And thank you, uh, AFD, which is actually the mother institution of Proparco, uh, for giving us the opportunity to share some elements uh, regarding uh, our experience in this uh, energy transition. Uh, so as mentioned by Karen, Proparco is part of uh, AFD Group. We are the development financial institution of, um, of, uh, of the group, uh, supporting and financing sustainable development projects uh, in the private sector. And actually, uh, as a group, it gives us uh, the opportunity to, to mobilize uh, complementary tools and, uh, and instruments. Uh, in the first slide, I'd like to share, uh, you see that as a group, the energy transition mobilized a good portion of the overall funding we have deployed in the past year in the region. Uh, between 2015 and 19, the group activities reached over 3 billion euros of commitment and 1.4 billion euros of disbursement. And actually, the energy transition represents roughly 20% of uh, those overall amounts, 600 million euros for approval and uh, 
half of it in terms of disbursements. And these projects include various financial instruments, mainly loans, but also grants and equity investments also when it comes to, uh, to ProParco. Um, so I think we, we, we definitely see some common uh, energy trajectories, I would say, in the region. However, I think we try to, to have some uh, customized approach uh, depending on the country and ground context, uh, given the, the specific challenges they, 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 they might be facing. So we are working at levels where both public and private players are active. It could be access to electricity via rene renewable energy and mini grids, uh, construction of uh, power transmission lines, especially in least developed countries uh, and in rural areas, uh, construction and rehabilitation of hydro power plants, optimization of existing networks, development of storage capacity, and also prom promotion of energy efficiency. Uh, and this could be done either directly through uh, investing in infrastructure projects uh, or also through the financial intermediation, so th through uh, uh, through the banks with uh, dedicated credit lines allocated to uh, green energy or uh, climate projects. I just move on to those uh, next slides, which are from the International Energy Agency. Uh, they, they show they show uh, which are the source of funding by power generation type actually in the region, and we see that private investments are provided for all type of generation from. Uh, thermal to renewable energy, but as you can see, the proportion of private investment is quite significant for solar PV and wind facilities. And uh, according to IEA, this is uh, really due to favorable uh, policy incentives. Uh, we definitely see that uh, solar PV is now considered as a, as a new king of electricity generation, uh, uh, as it is now the cheapest source of, of electricity in most countries, as highlighted also by Benny in the in the in the in the few uh, uh, 2020 records and especially uh, uh, solar, solar farm and solar plants that have been uh, uh, that uh, that started last year um, so this is the cheapest source of funding of, of electricity sorry and the costs have decreased uh, so solar is really expected to triple before 2030 uh, under the current uh, policies the next slide shows the increasing also portion of, uh, of IPPs uh, under a license scheme and competitive bidding from 2015 onwards. Uh, actually, it reflects uh, the increasing participation of the private st stakeholders. You, ca you can see on the left side of the graph 2014 that the IPP under a license scheme uh, or competitive bidding were very few. And uh, in 2018, it has significantly increased. And the, the two past last years, uh, the trajectory is more, is more likely uh, uh, the same. Uh, I think to illustrate the cooperation uh, uh, between public and private sector, I think Vietnam probably is a good illustration of what uh, ProParco and AFD are uh, jointly uh, uh, doing uh, to support specifically uh, uh, infrastructure networks. Um, AFD, for instance, is financing the, the public policy in order to uh, strengthen the network, um, which must integrate uh, additional intermittent capacity and renewable on, on renewable energy. Uh, we have to, to, to remind that last year, nine gigawatt of uh, solar PV capacity have been installed in, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, so uh, uh, AFD is providing a loan of 80 million euros um, uh, in favor of uh, EVN subsidiary in charge of electricity distribution in South Vietnam, which is SPC. And this aims at strengthening the distribution network, reduce technical losses, and allow integration of additional PV and wind power plants in the future. And th those new production capacities will be partially financed by banks, but also by development financial institutions such as ProParco through debt or equity investments. So AFD really can provide this upstream support to prepare the regulatory framework and uh, to support also the bankability of the off-taker, in, uh, in particular strengthening its financial basis. Um, so these interventions can definitely facilitate the bankability of projects and ProParco's intervention afterwards. Uh, with regards to the limitation, uh, in order to, uh, to have uh, additional investment from, from the private sector, um, from our perspective, I think there are two main elements. The first one are the regulations in place, and the second one is probably the technical constraints related to the electricity network. So this could translate into various situations. We have countries where uh, there is not enough regulatory stability in the energy sector. Uh, for instance, no structured and regular tenders, uncertainty on electricity sales tariffs. 
We have also a situation where PPAs, so the, the power purchase agreements are not bankable and which uh, do not allow financing for renewable energy projects by private actors. Countries in which IPPs do not have the right actually to connect to the grid uh, or in which the grid is not sufficiently robust or developed to uh, welcome additional renewable capacities production. Uh, and also situation in which the quality of the public off-taker, uh, the buyer, is insufficient for private actors to invest. Uh, and it is not possible to contract private PPAs with, uh, with robust actors. So those are really uh, the, the, the key elements for us to, uh, to consider uh, investments uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in, those, in those projects. So the stability of the renewable energy uh, support policy and the bankability of PPAs are really the, the, the leveraging factors that could enable additional uh, private investments and DFI investments in, in particular. Um, we, can, we can definitely uh, uh, see a role for the, for the central government to overcome those difficulties uh, uh, by providing a stable regular, re regulatory framework uh, in order to really have an optimal risk allocation uh, between the various stakeholders. Um, um, through the organization of competitive tenders with bankable PPAs, with take or pay clause, termination clause, which can attract debts and uh, allow investor returns and also recognition of lenders' rights. Um, so this, um, this, uh, this is really the, the key point to allow uh, additional intermittent production, um, renewable energy production to, to, to come in, into the grid. Uh, I'll just, I just finish with a, a concrete example, I think, uh, that we have in the region, which is the Lao Nalteum 2 uh, hydro project. So this is a, a one gigawatt hydroelectric project uh, with a 25-year concession contract between uh, the SPV and the government of Lao. Uh, the offtake, so the buyer of the electricity is mainly EGAT, which is the Thai utility for 95% of the electricity production and the remaining 5% is for the Lao market and the shareholders includes uh, uh, EDF, EGAT and also uh, the, the Lao government. Uh, the project has been subsidized by uh, international donors, uh, the World Bank, ADB and also AFD actually to support the participation of the Lao government into the shareholding structure of this project. And what is interesting here is uh, the risk coverage structure. Actually, the regulatory risk is covered by a concession contract, which provides stability and visibility um, and protects also the project against regulatory changes. Uh, there is also the curtailment risk, uh, which is limited due, due to the construction of uh, dedicated transmission lines to connect the projects to the Lao and Thai networks. And the off-take risk, which is the EGAT risk, we have an off-taker here, which is a, a good signature and which has a, a strong financial position. Uh, so that's also a key point. And the construction and operation uh, risk is managed by EDF International. So there is a, a, a player with a significant experience in uh, hydroelectric projects. So this structure really allowed donors to, to catalyze the participation of Thai and international commercial banks and DFIs. The funding provided by donors was 160 million US, including 30 million from AFD and 30 million from Proparco. And behind, commercial banks have been able to finance uh, the projects uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with debt financing up to uh, 340 million US and also provide political risk guarantees. And um, the financing Thai commercial banks have provided also some funding up to uh, 500 million US. So we really see that uh, that's, uh, that's an example where the conditions are, are there to, um, and the, the cooperation between the public and the private stakeholders is good enough to, uh, to support the emergence of uh, 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 structuring projects, energy projects, renewable uh, energy projects in the region. Uh, thank you, and I'll be pleased to, to pursue the discussions uh, with you. Okay, brilliant, uh, Raphael. Thank you so much for that. So what we're gonna do now is bring the three of you on, on screen together and I'm going to put maybe one or two questions to each one of you as well. We have also got questions coming in from our uh, attendees watching online as well. I think super points made by all of you and I think a lot of points too you seem to agree on or, or there certainly seems to be um, issues that come up for all of you from your own experiences. But Benny, if I can maybe go to you first then. So just looking at your presentation and some of the points you made. Um, and in that presentation, 
You can see it looking at the various power development plans in several of the Southeast Asian countries you touched on, many of them are going to still continue to install traditional hydrocarbon power plants. So do you think they should be the focus of public-private partnerships as well, or, or should they only focus on the renewable energy sector? Um, thank you very much, Karen. Um, so allow me to respond to that question in the perspective of the so-called sustainable uh, sustainability. So in general, sustainable development plays an important role uh, for the ASEAN to attract the foreign and domestic investment, as well as to navigate rapid economic growth and also uh, the issue being on economy or environmental. Um, the countries in the region with its various level of economic development is indeed experiencing a challenge in meeting these sustainability goals uh, if we uh, pull directly to the issue of the power sector or energy is also having a challenge to balance and how much renewable energy that should be put into the system considering uh, the, the, the situation that we have at this stage where we need to also provide the energy security, energy affordability, energy accessibility for the peoples in the region. So this is where actually is also uh, the partnership between the public and private will become more crucial and emerge as increasingly prominent level for the ASEAN countries to achieve its plan on the sustainable uh, development. Uh, the, the benefit of government to partner with the private company is, of course, again, a, a financial is, uh, issue, that uh, uh, the, the innovation issue. So why in this month of the focus is renewable energy. Um, however, the role of the private sector is through its financial capability and technology or innovation also needed in the traditional hydrocarbon sectors. So one example that I say that for many years, uh, I mean, this will be work by SERPA that's going to be to, to remove these coal power plants uh, based on it. But to some context, it will be still there. Then to some context, we will need also uh, the carbon capture, utilization and storage, where critics still maintains the technology remain unproven and might need deliver the fast emission reduction. So this is a thing I think where the private sectors can also should not away from from this the issue only only focus on renewable energy but it's also to address uh, comprehensively on both issues i saw that thank you karen okay thank you very much benny and maybe i'll go to you serpa for maybe your responses to what benny has said first of all but then i'd really like to talk to you about about a point you made in your presentation about government willpower being critical um, and, and the need to make sure that, you know, you get everybody to sign up to your roadmap. So maybe responses to Benny's points there. And then how do you get that kind of government will, willpower to make sure they, they really do buy into your roadmap? Thank you very much, uh, Karen. So two questions, actually. Um, quite intertwined. Uh, so all, first of all, on uh, points regarding existing coal-fired and fossil fuel facilities and um, energy transition sort of tending to limit its uh, scope on uh, new demand and new uh, renewable energy into the, into the energy mix. So in many cases, we have seen that the existing system is so dominated by the fossil fuels that we inevitably will need to address that. Um, and there is two perspectives to that. One is that uh, the Southeast Asian economies and populations don't want to be uh, breathing and swallowing up all the implications of the fossil fuel power generation um, externalities uh, which are negative, meaning that uh, the, the WHO has now issued a statement that there are some 7 billion people whose lives are affected fatally by uh, the greenhouse gases largely generated by uh, the current energy system. So we have a reason to look into the current um, power uh, production 
uh, especially on the fossil fuel side. So there, these countries, all of these countries have plans to uh, build more uh, coal and fossil fuel facilities and uh, ETP suggests that there are solid technologically and financially viable alternatives to that in the renewable energy sector. And if I just uh, sort of paraphrase what uh, Raphael was saying, the alternatives largely depend on setting the policy uh, levers right so that technologies can comp competitively uh, make their case and private sector partners can come to the picture safely and securely to provide that. Now existing uh, power systems, they still take up some between 30 to 60% of the country's uh, energy mix. Um, how to deal with that? I mean, they are constantly uh, oozing their uh, greenhouse gases into our blue sky. Uh, so um, here we need to look at repurposing of these uh, facilities. And the reason is that um, if, the, uh, if the playing field is leveled, meaning the prices reflect uh, market prices, the tariffs re reflect the, the marginal cost of production of energy, these assets are no longer bankable and it's really visible as China has also made its statement in the United Nations um, uh, General Assembly meeting uh, last week, uh, it is no longer going to be financing power, coal powered facilities. So the financing is dwindling, it's getting more expensive. Um, in, uh, in the final analysis, the societies, the citizens of these countries do not want to bear the fiscal burden of paying for the liabilities any longer. So two major rationale to start looking at the abatement and uh, repurposing of coal uh, fired and fossil fuel fired uh, facilities, uh, which relate to the macroeconomic implications and the environmental implications. Now you asked me also about the my roadmap. So I'm very glad to tell you that first of all, we have a very dedicated small secretariat at ETP to help um, me think about these issues. But not only that, we have a vibrant community of aligned programs that are associated with ETP. Our members all have, um, such as uh, AFD, have uh, enormous networks of uh, collaborators and the philanthropies bring their own networks into the picture and we are very collaborative and inclusive platform to bring in others um, development partners into the picture including the government stakeholders so um, how to generate this uh, public opinion um, it starts really from the grassroots knowledge programs it starts from the technical know-how uh, at policy uh, makers levels and practitioners uh, in between the two so universities need to add courses on energy transition, energy efficiency and renewable energy. The prices are already plummeting to such levels that uh, the tipping point is near. It's very near and uh, there is no sort of turning back anymore. Um, and the information is out there in the public domain, in the social media, through the university courses, through online courses. So we are all in it now and we all want to have the blue sky and uh, the wonderful futures of, to, for our next generation through this process. Thank okay. you, Karen. Thank you, Sirpa. And it's great to hear such positive news about the energy transition. Some people will tell you that, you know, it, it's quite bleak. Um, that people don't want to pay more for their energy. Governments don't want to, you know, have situations where there are thousands and thousands of people on the streets, um, you know, giving out about the prices they pay for increased energy. And, and maybe if I can go to you, Raphael, on that point, from your experience again, maybe going back to the point that Sirpa made, how do you get everybody on board? How do you ensure that governments are going to be able to put up with the pain that may be required to make this transition while ensuring that civilians, that people on the ground also buy into it and indeed get the private sector involved as, as well? How, how do you get all of those stakeholders, if you like, engaged in this? Well, thank you. I think first is about uh coordinating, so the discussing together. And I think uh, the value added of AFD Group is being able also to interact with the uh, uh, various, various kind of stakeholders, uh, public stakeholders on the public uh, policy side, uh, also uh, supporting uh, 
platform uh, such as ETP uh, uh, to, to, to raise some uh, advocacy points uh, with regards to, uh, to, to, to the energy transition and being able also to, uh, to combine that with the requirements of the private sectors in terms of uh, bankability and, and expectations. So it's a matter of uh, being able also to understand the, those local contexts and to see uh, what kind of uh, obstacles we need to, uh, to, um, to overcome country by country. Uh, you know that the legal framework are, are, are definitely uh, uh, not the same. The, the feed-in tariffs, again, uh, uh, I've mentioned earlier, the, the, the PPAs, uh, uh, templates and so on, uh, are, are pretty dif different from one country to another. And uh, we need to go uh, uh, case by case to, uh, to see how we can um, uh, overcome those obstacles to bring additional uh, uh, private investments so that additional uh, in renewable energy uh, production capacities could be uh, um, could be uh, uh, settled I would say in the in, in in the region and just on innovation um, Raphael and engaging the private sector there what are the kind of incentives that they are looking for to engage and bringing their innovations in, in, into the energy transition in Southeast Asia? What kind of returns are they looking for on their investments? Mm -hmm. I think we see, we see probably few raising uh, uh, technical points on which uh, an increased cooperation between public and private players might be necessary. Uh, the first one is the, is the energy storage. Uh, for which we definitely see that it will be a strategic point for the development of solar and wind power uh, in, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, because we need to deal with uh, and to manage these, uh, this question of uh, intermittent production. Uh, and um, just to illustrate that, I think in Vietnam, uh, um, we, the government has started to talk about the need to introduce in the, the energy storage component uh, in a new solar projects, uh, especially on PV rooftop uh, projects, and there is no regulatory tariff framework to allow these investments. Uh, so the idea would be to include into the PPA maybe a, a, a pricing component that would help the developers uh, to uh, consider also uh, setting up some energy storage solution. And we've been approached also um, uh, recently in Samoa Islands by, by, uh, by a developer uh, who was willing also to, to introduce this component in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the PPA. So I think this is a, a raising point. And we have also uh, the second topic, I think, which is uh, coming up is the, the waste to energy aspects. Uh, for instance, in Vietnam, you see that in Hanoi, uh, there is a DFI which is planning to finance uh, waste to energy projects in the in the Bac Ninh province, uh, and actually the project will uh, partially source the the municipal waste and also in the industrial waste uh, and sell 100% of its electricity to to Vietnam, um, and this is once again I think a very uh, hybrid framework uh, with the public and private partnerships for the for the first the management and the collection of of the waste at the municipal level so i think it requires a lot of discussion to settle the the right frame and and then the usual uh, uh, discussions when it comes to uh, uh, electricity uh, production um, selling and transmission into the into the into the local networks okay rafael thank you very much uh, for that um, and i want to go to one or two questions as well from our attendees before that a question again for you benny the asian development bank it's embarking on a study that could lead to a program to shut down coal-fired plants in some asian countries known as the energy transition mechanism etu how do you see the role of investments from public and private sector initiatives with this backdrop with this program perhaps driving them in the future um thank you karen and i think it's also responding to the question from um audience um, from jack so uh, on uh, giving the the incentive about a uh, five hour of coal instead of renewable um yeah the asian development bank i think is embarking the studies that could lead to a program to so-called shut down the coal power power plant in in some countries in their region so it's called for energy transition mechanism uh and where it could it will see that the lost output that will be replaced by renewable energy source so that will be replaced the coal pipe uh coal fire power plant so this is expected to support the transition from coal to the clean energy uh delivered by a country-based fund structures so this is a concession fund from the development community, uh, developed countries, 
and philanthropy will be, be blended with the investment from the public and the private sectors. Uh, so this is where it will be significantly, uh, uh, sign highly significant about the scheme is that it will provide a means to get a public and private blended finance directly behind uh, specific projects that are designed to support this energy transition. But again, of course, uh, it should not only uh, uh, compensate the, the, the owner of the power plant, it also uh, should be comprehensively, I mean, it's in line with what the SIPA mentioned earlier, uh, to, to address the economic issue, so that it has to be ensured adequately and competitively priced the clean energy supply needed for uh, the, the, the customer, for the growing economy. I stop there. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, Benny. And um, we've got a question in from one of our attendees watching online. Thank you for your question, Kwa Zeya, um, who wants to know, the extension of smart grids sounds great. The political will plays a crucial role in decarbonisation. The public wants energy efficiency and does not want pollution. Still, this is costly. There should be strong support to developing countries in the region in that aspect. I think a very good point that perhaps we've touched on through all three of your presentations, but maybe Sirpa, going back to you again, perhaps you could just add a few words to what Kwa Zeya has just said there about the fact that, you know, the political will plays a crucial role in decarbonization. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Kwa Zeya, for that good question. Absolutely, uh, there should be strong support to developing countries. And my own conviction is that there is, and a uh, lot more is uh, forthcoming. Uh, the international community is now talking about uh, $100 billion a year to uh, the climate purposes. And uh, that's the target for uh, under this Paris uh, Climate Agreement in order to support uh, developing countries with their what they call conditional nationally determined um, contributions to reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, what's important here is, is definitely the part that the governments and the policymakers, the politicians play in the countries. So um, num a big number of savings and uh, repurposing of funding for energy transition can come from the reform of the subsidies that are currently in place. So someone estimated it uh, in a conference that was recently organized uh, on the same topic that in, in Indonesia alone, these subsidies amount to some 7 billion a year. So uh, that goes far to making the bill for the uh, 20, 30 billion annual expense of the energy transition. And remember also that once prices are allowed to, to integrate market forces, the consumer will be the beneficiary of uh, renewable energy in terms of cost of energy. So who wants to pay more than you have to? Uh, let's ask that question of the civil society members. And then um, the other point that should be made here really is that we are all coming out of COVID-19 uh, pandemic impacted uh, economies, um, recessions, uh, in especially in Southeast Asia, which requires stimulus. Um, this stimulus uh, funding that is available in uh, through the fiscal processes and balances of payments um, should best be spent on clean objectives such as uh, energy transition. So here's another source of funding that will be able to kickstart the economies and diversify them to um, a wonderful new episode in Southeast Asian economic development. Well, on that positive note, we leave this roundtable discussion, but um, it would be brilliant to think that um, over the next uh, decade or so, we'll all be um, using different, cleaner, um, wonderful sources of energy. I want to um, give a big thanks to our three wonderful speakers for this session, Benny Suryadi, Sirpa Jarvan Pa, and Raphael de Geer. Thank you so much for your wonderful, insightful contributions. And um, I'm going to hand over now to Rini Wintem, my fellow co-moderator, and she'll tell you what's coming up. Over to you, Rini. Uh, Rini. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen, and your team. And what a rousing and constructive start to the day. That was quite, I learned a huge amount, and there's so much to discuss, which will come up, I hope, later on in the conference. But that was absolutely super with all the speakers. Thank you so much. 
And now we're going to take a 15 minute break. So come back either at 10.15 or at 15.15, depending on which country you're watching us from. And we'll be back with a closer look at the pressures faced by people in countries bordering the Mekong River and how to balance economic progress with the bio, uh, protecting biodiversity around the fragile areas surrounding the Mekong. So lots to talk about. Enjoy your coffee or tea and look forward to seeing you in 15 minutes. See you soon. Ah, hello, Lai. Well done. Thank you for standing in for Anulak. Very good to see you. Hello, Rene. Uh, yes, Tim Lee speaking. That's terrific. Are you, uh, are you, I'm, it's Lee, I've been calling you Lai. So if I make yeah, a mistake, sorry. I'm terribly yeah. sorry. Um, I'll yeah, try to Lee. say Lee, but if I forget, it'll be Lai. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, okay. No matter, yeah. Lee. Thank you. Nice to see you. <laughs> Did you have? A, are you in Bangkok or somewhere else? I'm in Vientiane. Vientiane. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Very. And you're going to read the material that Anulak prepared. Yes. Yes. Great. And you are able to answer questions around the subject. I. I yes. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> Carl, okay. very good to see you too. We met the other day and lovely to see you again. Good to see you again. Uh, all set. Can you uh, hear me okay? I can hear you brilliantly. Okay, nice great, to thanks. see Charlotte's smiling face as always, always encouraging Charlotte. So it's uh, Jake has been here since the beginning somewhere. So I look forward to Jake tuning in and then I will just tell you briefly what we're going to be doing. <clears throat> I don't know if Jake is with us. Uh, not yet. I've sent him an invitation. Lovely. So I guess when he heard coffee break, he thought okay, <laughs> <laughs> that was too encouraging. Yes. I yeah, know the feeling. Maybe. I suddenly realized it wasn't for us. <laughs> <clears throat> So, uh, Dr. Lee, I'm not sure that we've met before. It's nice to meet you. My name oh, is Carl. I'm, oh, uh, yeah, hi, Dr. Carl. Yeah, uh, I, I met you in Bangkok. Yeah, nice oh, to okay. see you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I met you in Bangkok when we had some uh, uh, I think, conference of the uh, Masi uh, related uh, workshop. Uh, could, could well be. I, I, I haven't actually left Bangkok for two years since COVID. So the, oh. this is where I am pretty much permanently at the moment. Are you locked yeah. down, Carl? Is there a lockdown in Bangkok? Uh, no. Pretty much. I mean, it was starting to ease a little bit, but actually it's more been the issue of the international travel. It's not possible to easily travel back and forth without yeah. quarantine. It, it's even been like that here in France, between England and France. It's a lot better now. I've got Jake at last. Jake, you're the missing link. I'm your moderator, Rini Windham. Good to meet you. Can you unmute? I think I am unmuted. Yes, you are unmuted. Brilliant. And thank you for getting here really early. It was lovely to see your, <clears throat> to see your name well in advance there. 
Um, but you're the only one I haven't met previously. So I'm just going to, un uh, <clears throat> to run through what you already know, really, that <clears throat> I will do a short introduction, or well, not so short. Um, I'll introduce each one of you very briefly, just with a wave so that people know which one you are. Um, there, and so you wave when I say hello to you. Then uh, a little uh, background on the subject. And then I will introduce the first speaker, who is Carl. Uh, when Carl has finished, uh, then it's uh, Tim Me, And then finally, Jake coming to you. And each time your speech is between seven and absolute maximum 10 minutes, because then it'll give us a chance. To, hopefully, we'll get lots of audience questions, but also um, questions uh, that you have sent me very kindly. Uh, I think, yes, I've got some from Jake, from Carl, and all three of you. Um, and anything else you want to be asked, do let me know before we start. <clears throat> and um, the procedure is fairly simple, and then a roundup at the end. If there's time, I will ask each of you for a quick comment at the very end as well to round it off, but we'll see if we have time. Okie doke. So um, it's been very lively so far. By the way, which of you have any of you got um, uh, slides, PPTs or not? I think you're all speaking without PPTs, is that right? I've got one slide. Right, that's Jake and Carl. Yeah. Uh, no, I'll just be speaking. Thanks. Right, and um, Lee? Lee has some slides there. I, I, How many I, I have uh, six slides. Six slides is fine for the time. Okay. <laughs> so as long as you stick to a limit of 10 minutes, seven is better, but it, 10 is fine. We have the same problem with the sun. I tried to shut it out yesterday. I may have to do the same again, but uh, it keeps playing around. I don't know if that bothers you, uh, Charlotte. Otherwise, I have to close the blind, but then it becomes darker. Otherwise, on the fact that we are jealous that you have some sun, no, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we had a big storm, and you had the sun in your face. We were quite oh, <laughs> that's a, a real rainstorm you had, did you? Yeah, yeah can yesterday I, at, uh, at two. Yeah. Yes, Jake. Sorry, can I just ask who will present my, actually, two slides? Um, although I think one of them... Tim Lee will show, so I'll only spend like two seconds on it. Um, um, who will show my slides? Charlotte, like is, to? Charlotte is That's, coordinating the slides. So, yeah, actually, I will put it on screen during your speech. Do you have just one slide? Yeah. Okay. Okay, hello, Jack. <laughs> hey, good yeah, to see you. you. Yeah, nice to see you again. <laughs> Things Long are, time. It, I know. I'm, it's. I can't believe I haven't left the country for eighteen months. Gosh. Yeah, me too. Me too. Almost two years. Oh. Two years. Uh, February. Since February, almost two years. So if it's come to January, it will be two years for me. Wow. I stay only oh, in Vietnam. <laughs> Everybody's going to get to know their own country really well, except that yeah. we got stuck in France. We came three days before they locked down here. So I haven't been back to England since March 2020 either, uh, which is our wow. home. <laughs> but it's lovely. Yeah. We, we love your country, Charlotte. <laughs> we, we don't want to go home because they have food shortages and fuel shortages and lots of trouble since Brexit. <laughs> So, all three of you feeling set, Carl first, Lee second, Jake third, full of ideas. If I come to you for a question and um, somebody else wants to continue with that answer, then let me know either by raising your hand or by looking at me or by butting in, <laughs> because it's nicer coming from you and having an interaction between you. <laughs> Carl and Jake, you know each other already? I think all, all three of us know, know each oh, other. Oh, even better. Yes. Because yeah. I, I mean, I'd be happy if a discussion takes off between the three of you that you barely need me, that you just bounce off each other. So we'll see if that happens or not, depending on what the questions are. Um, and Charlotte, you'll do the same with the countdown for the start again. Yeah. Great. Uh, uh, I don't know who's changing the slide, but be careful because everyone can see the change. And for now, I think it be it's better if we keep the coffee break. Uh, yeah. 
yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I, 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 I try to test, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no worries. Mean that if I move, uh, the participant will see, right? Yes. I, oh. Kim Lee, I've got a, a question for you. Do you have a yes. slide of the MRC's um, strategic framework with the five priorities? Do you have that? Yeah, I have presentation? five, five uh, strategic priorities, yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Right, so we'll just wait for the next uh, four minutes and uh, if anybody has any other questions, just say the word. <clears throat> uh, I think I will go off stage, Srini, but... Uh, okay, uh, and you will still give me the count show. like last time yeah. with on screen, super. Uh, oh, it's not on screen on screen this time, but I'll send, just send you a message in the chat. In the chat. Okay, I'll yeah. keep the chat going then. Perfect. See you. Thanks. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you, Charlotte. See you soon. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. This is coming off.
Hello again and welcome back. Very nice to see you. Do hope you enjoyed your short break, whatever you were up to, and you can feel refreshed and ready to ask lots of questions. Don't forget, your questions are the most important when you're watching, and on the right hand side in the questions, if you type them in, we will do our best to get through them at the end of this session. But first, of course, we'll hear from the speakers. So this is our third round table for this conference, and we're taking a look at the Mekong River. This round table is called, by the way, the sun shines in my eyes, we're in the south of France and it's just brightly coming in the window. I hope the weather's nice where you are. The title of our conference uh, our session, this round table three is Mekong, how to ensure biodiversity preservation in the context of a river in permanent transformation. To discuss this issue, I have the pleasure of being joined by three expert speakers who have a bank of knowledge behind them. They'll provide some positive ideas into how this region can prosper and yet avoid the devastation of climate change. I shall introduce them in more detail when they come to give their presentations. But for now, they are Carl Middleton, who's director of the Center for Social Development Studies at Chulalongkorn University. Hello, Carl. It's waving there. Dr. Tim Lee, who has kindly stepped in at very short notice, he's Chief River Basin Planner of the Mekong River Commission, the MCR. Hello, Lee. And Jake Brunner, who's head of the Indo-Burma Group at the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Hello, Jake. And I'm Rini Windham, BBC journalist. I was and now moderator for this session with the greatest of pleasure. So first, a short introduction to the subject. The Mekong River flows from the Tibetan Plateau through six countries, China, Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia and Vietnam. It's nearly 5,000 kilometers long, making it the world's 12th longest river and the sixth longest in Asia. It's a major trade route between Western China and Southeast Asia, and the lives of millions of people depend on this river. Interestingly, each country has a different name for it. In Thailand and Laos, and you experts in Thailand, excuse my pronunciation, the Mekong River's called Menam Kong. In Cambodia, they call it Mekong or Tonle Mekong. And in Vietnam, it's called Song Me Kong. That's a literal translation meaning a river with nine dragons. That's because in Vietnam, the Mekong River is divided into nine parts and flows into the sea. And in Myanmar, it's just called Mekong. A few bits of data for you. The basin is home to one of the richest areas of biodiversity in the world, with more than 20,000 plant species and 850 fish species discovered so far. Nearly 65 million people live around the Mekong, and an estimated 80% of them depend on the river and its rich natural resources for their livelihoods. So it's obvious that sustainable development is crucial for the environment and for communities living near the river basin. Today, the river is rapidly changing as economic development, urbanization and industrialization are transforming the basin. The Mekong River gives opportunities for growth, for instance, hydropower production, agriculture, fisheries and transport and trade, as well as tourism. But, and that's a very big but, without coordinated and effective development, the Mekong may suffer from too many pressures. We could be slowly killing the golden goose. Development pressures are also creating new challenges for the countries in the lower Mekong Basin. These include environmental degradation, loss of biodiversity, and climate change with a risk of worsening floods and droughts. The damage is caused by dam construction for hydroelectric power, which cools the water and harms the fish, also by excessive groundwater extraction. Fast-moving urban and infrastructure development, deforestation and mining have all taken their toll. Sadly, as so often, it's the poorest people who pay the price. Pollution and the impact of climate change have also degraded the biodiversity and quality of life here. But this doesn't affect each country equally. 
or indeed each citizen equally. Scenarios for the next 30 years predict a one meter sea level rise and that could displace up to 7 million people. Economic demands have put the Mekong under increasing pressure. So the big challenge is how can environmental conservation and economic progress coexist? But rather than focusing on the downsides and the gloomy side, we have to look positively to the future in this session. If we hurry, there's still time to mitigate the worst problems. How can we protect biodiversity under these changing pressures? How can we enhance environmental, social and economic prospects for every person living near the Mekong and keep them healthy? How can the community unite to work towards an integrated and sustainable solution? Our speakers will shed light on these challenges. So our first speaker for this roundtable is Carl Middleton. He's director at the Center for Social Development Studies at Chula Longkorn University in Thailand. The program's ranked number one in development studies in Thailand and number 51 to 100 in the whole world in development studies. Carl will examine water management in the Mekong Basin. He'll look at how the management of this area could be very much improved in the future. And he'll show how this will have a positive impact on the surrounding environment as well as the ecosystems. It'll be a great pleasure to listen to you, Carl. So off you go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rani, for that kind introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank AFD and especially Louise and Charlotte for the invitation to join this roundtable. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion that we'll have. So the, the topic um, is not one that I often get the opportunity to talk on, thinking specifically about biodiversity preservation. And I'm therefore very excited to do so. Um, thinking about the question, how to ensure biodiversity preservation in the context of a river and permanent transformation, as an academic made me think of, well, what are the underlying questions that we might need to answer to address this one? And two particular questions came to my mind that I want to structure my intervention around. The first is, why ensure biodiversity uh, preservation in the first place? And the second is, who should ensure biodiversity preservation? Um, looking around the region, I suggest that we can see at least four approaches uh, tackling these questions at present. Um, I'll call these the conservation approach, the sustainable development approach, the environmental justice approach, and the rights of nature approach. So for my intervention for this roundtable, I'd like to unpack each of these in a little bit more detail and then reflect on the current situation and the prospects for each, um, each trajectory. Uh, so first, let me begin with the conservation approach and why ensure biodiversity. Conservation perspective, the, the, the reason why lies with the intrinsic value of a pristine nature. And I think we especially see this reflected in conservation as a global agenda, and then also how it connects to national and local ideas of conservation. Um, we can see this perhaps at the global level most clearly when we look at international commitments to the Convention on Biological Diversity. In terms of who ensures this approach towards biodiversity preservation, I th again, I think we probably see it most directly through the work of international conservation organizations who work with relevant agencies of the state. But I would also emphasize that within the Mekong region, there's many local organizations who echo these values of international organizations on the aspiration for global conservation um, and global biodiversity preservation. Um, to give some examples at present, present from the Mekong region, um, recognizing that economic growth and uh, environmental protection we see organizations like IUCN and WWF uh, tackle both sides. So for example, um, in relation to the Mekong Basin, the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, has prepared studies and advocates for a 100% renewable energy transformation for Mekong countries by 2050 that would um, avoid the need for large harmful projects and essentially ensure a, a sustainable transformation of the energy sector. Um, but then, the WWF also conducts research on the impacts of large dams on fisheries and sediment movements and floods that connects to the, um, the value of uh, protecting global uh, biodiversity within the Mekong. 
And then lastly, the WWF uh, documents and raises awareness about the continual discovery of new species in the Mekong Basin. Um, I think it's important to note that the Mekong is the, second, the world's second most biodiverse river, second only to the Amazon. And there are continually new species being discovered. So I think in terms of what next for this pathway, um, really the, the pathway requires the deeper affirmation of the goals of the conservation of, bio, uh, conservation of biological diversity, uh, sorry, the Convention on Biological Diversity by governments, and especially its mainstreaming into public policy to inform related policies on energy, water, and agricultural policy. Uh, there will be an, an opportunity to do this um, in a couple of months. I think actually in this month, there'll be a large meeting on the Convention on Biological Diversity, so it's an opportunity to affirm that. The second path that I see is what I might label the green economy or the sustainable development approach. So under this approach, natural resources are the foundation of economic growth and human well-being, more broadly defined, and therefore they need to be sustainably managed. Um, in terms of who ensures biodiversity under this approach, I think it's primarily led by state agencies, but working with non-state actors, including the private sector and the public. Um, in terms of a current example from the Mekong R River, well, I think the eminent example would be the work of the Mekong River Commission, and we'll hear from Dr. Tim Lee shortly on, on uh, the work of the MRC. Um, and some of the examples of the MRC's approach include the Basin Development Plan, the Initiative on Sustainable Hydropower, and then also specific decision-making tools uh, in relation to hydropower dams, such as the procedures for notification, prior consultation and agreement, and decision support tools like a strategic environmental assessment study that was conducted in 2010. In terms of what next for this approach, if we're honest, the biggest challenge for the green economy approach is how to effectively balance between biological conservation and economic growth, given that they're often in tension with each other, and economic growth is regularly privileged over biodiversity conservation. The third approach is somewhat different. Um, so I call this an environmental, justice, an environmental justice approach. So under an environmental justice approach, the why of the approach is to recognize that healthy ecosystems and their biodiversity are important to community livelihoods and cultures at the local level. Um, this also, in the context of a transboundary river like the Mekong River, requires not only uh, the protection of local biodiversity and local commons, but also protection of the transboundary commons because they connect across scales. In terms of who ensures biodiversity under an environmental justice approach, I think we should foreground here the important work of local groups, uh, including indigenous people and especially those whose lives connect directly to the Mekong River and its resources. However, they don't work alone. Um, the, the biodiversity conservation work that they do uh, connects or they connect regularly to local governments and also network across scales, including with multi-scale multi civil society. To give a current example from the Mekong Basin, I think we could look to Northern Thailand and the network that's emerged called the, Ings Pe the Ing People's Council that has networked communities together for wetland conservation, fi uh, fisheries management, and local knowledge documentation. So they simultaneously work as networks of local communities to protect local commons and biodiversity, both through environmental management, but also connecting it to cultural and sacred values. But they also then engage in advocacy uh, to protect those, uh, those local and transnational commons. So for example, in terms of the advocacy work that's been done, it includes uh, bringing an administrative court case in Thailand towards the first Mekong mainstream dam, the Zyabri Dam, that was in uh, 2014. So I think in terms of this approach for prospects, we need to acknowledge the important contribution of well-organized local community activities to protecting biodiversity conservation. But we also need to recognize that not all local practices guarantee biodiversity conservation at the same time. The fourth uh, pathway I will call the rights of nature approach. So for the rights of nature approach, this is um, a global movement that is increasingly materializing also in mainland Southeast Asia. And it essentially says that nature has an intrinsic value independent of humans. So in other words, in, uh, living entities, which could include not just species, but entire systems, such as a river system, 
uh, that includes the living and non-living components should be seen as having value separate from humans' existence. In terms of who ensures the biodiversity preservation in this case, at present in human affairs, nature cannot represent itself directly. So if we look at examples around the world where this has happened, then humans still act as a role of guardian to place into legislation the rights of nature. Um, in terms of an example from the uh, Mekong River, this is an emerging discussion. For example, the Save the Mekong Coalition of NGOs has convened a, a global, sorry, has contributed to a global movement called the Rights of Rivers Movement. And that has a universal declaration of the rights of rivers as the key part of the movement including placing the right of rivers into national law. Um, in terms of what next, if we look globally, there's a growing number of rivers that have legal standing. Perhaps the most well-known one is the Wanganui River in New Zealand. And so we need a discussion about what that might mean for the Mekong River. So in conclusion, um, to work on biodiversity preservation meaningfully in the Mekong Basin, we really need to be clear on the fundamental questions which are why ensure biodiversity conservation and who should be doing it. As I've tried to show in this intervention, there are a diversity of possible answers and there are many practices in the region that are partly synergistic and partly in tension with each other. And I think the next step really is to have a more inclusive public discussion about the approaches that are being taken and the best ways forward for biodiversity preservation, actually foregrounding this as an issue uh, rather than only thinking in terms of sustainable development. And I think the value of that is to actually start looking at the underpinning values and visions that are at the heart of current public policies that relate to biodiversity and take those values and those value-based discussions seriously if we really want to have biodiversity continuing to be important for the present and future generations. Uh, so with that uh, intervention, I'd like to thank Rene for the time and I'm looking forward to our discussion. And I'd like to thank you very much indeed, Carl, for that very good opening speech and a new concept for me, but maybe not for many other people, the rights of nature as opposed to human rights, and also the rights of rivers, which we might be discussing later on in the discussion. Do uh, put your questions, don't forget you watching at home, and uh, I hope you were as riveted as I was listening there to Carl. Um, your questions in the question box, and we will come to them hopefully at the end of the discussion, including some of our own questions too. Our next speaker I have the pleasure of introducing is Dr. Tim Lee, who's kindly standing in for Anulag Kittihun, who's unfortunately delayed on travels and he can't be with us, but Dr. Lee has very kindly agreed to read his material and also to be there to answer questions. Dr. Tim is Chief River Basin Planner for the Mekong River Commission, the MCR Secretariat. His job is to lead basin development strategy and technically supervise the, the implementation of hydropower, navigation, agriculture, irrigation, and climate change adaptation. Lee will speak about the importance of conservation around the basin, the role of the Mekong River Commission in ensuring that nature is not sacrificed to economics, the point that Carl brought up earlier, and uh, also um, the challenges that the MCR faces. This is really the heart of our session, how to preserve biodiversity when the area is undergoing so much economic development and constant transformation. So how is the Mekong River Commission, the MCR, helping? Thanks so much for standing in for Anulak Lee, and now it's over to you. I look forward to it. Thank you, uh, Rene, for very good introductions and also brief uh, introduction of the Mekong. And also thank Carl for uh, putting some of the uh, background information on the, uh, the Mekong and environment. So uh, I, I have the privilege to join uh, this roundtable discussions and I'm very pleased to introduce uh, you the status and trends of the Mekong and then we outline what the Mekong River commissions and the Mekong uh, Basin Development Strategy 10 year 2021-2030 will do in terms of responses to address the changing conditions 
of the Mekongs that uh, Carl has mentioned. So uh, this slide uh, show you the summary of the basin trends and outlooks against some strategic indicators of the basin condition related to environments, social, economics, and climate change. So four aspects. And then the first three uh, indicators show the basin condition related to environments. So including water flow conditions, water quality and sediment condition, status of environmental assets. So all of these three are related to environment. The, uh, for this uh, environmental aspect, the key issue uh, includes a change in flow regimes, uh, rapid uh, water level fluctuation, risk to water quality, reduced sediment transports, loss of wetland, and also reductions of the fish populations. And if you see here, the green dots mean the basin is in good conditions. Uh, it's on call risk to water quality. We still have good uh, water quality in the, in the basins. But then if you look into uh, a change in long-term flow regimes, uh, there are some conditions, uh, some concerns, uh, some concern that we need to address. And the, the red dot, it means that there is a, a considerable uh, concern to address. It means that it's not, not so good conditions. So, uh, and the, the green arrow means that the condition is expected to improve for the future outlooks, especially to 2040, where the red arrow uh, means the conditions is expected to decline. So if, if it is red, then uh, it, it's, uh, it will decline into the future. So our MRC works here is to improve the conditions from the uh, yellow, from the, the, the uh, red arrow to, to yellow and to greens uh, to improve the situations. And uh, through, we, we work in order to do this, we, we work uh, through the implementations of the Mekong Basin Development Strategy 2021-2030. Here uh, show the uh, strategy of the uh, Mekong River Basins for the next 10 years. The strategy is for the entire Mekong River Basins. It set out how water and related resources of the Mekong River Basin should be utilized, managed and conserved over the period of 2021 to 30. So if you look here, uh, the, 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 the strategy reflects the uh, the use, the use means development aspect and how we manage it and then conserve, it means we need to balance between developments and the environment. The strategy is for all relevant actors in uh, to, to guide toward achieving improvement, especially in the environmental, social, economic state of the Mekong River Basins. And it is a responsive strategy with a new directions that will shift from water resource planning Rather, the, rather doing uh, planning to more operational management of the basins. Here, uh, show you the, uh, the basin development strategy of 10 years. Uh, this includes uh, five strategic priority that's corresponding to five dimensions, uh, especially to reflect the, uh, the, the state of the basin that include uh, environment, social, economics, climate, and corporations. So uh, you look here, uh, we have five uh, priority. The priority number one, uh, focus on the uh, aims to maintain the ecological functions of the Mekong, which include the work on flow, water quality, sediment transport, and ecosystem service. And under this priority, we uh, aims to implement the uh, guidelines uh, re related to this flow, uh, sediments, and ecosystem. And under priority number two, uh, focus on social uh, well beings of the uh, community. That in, uh, includes the uh, 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 poverty reductions uh, as well. For the uh, priority number three, we focus on the economic aspects that's uh, more on the developments. Uh, we also, under this 
priority number three, Amasi will carry out proactive regional planning to develop uh, especially on new thresholds, environmental limits, more storage, especially storage, it includes also net natural storage and plus also uh, green gray uh, storage in the basins. We also work, we we'll work on the coordinations of water infrastructure, especially uh, rising of the uh, mainstream dams in the basins. And then uh, this proactive regional planning will also identify joint, new joint uh, investment projects uh, that will be agreed by member countries. And we will work uh, toward enhancing cooperations with China. And this also reflects, uh, reflects uh, the, the objective uh, priority number five including strengthening cooperations among all countries and stakeholders uh, as well as with the upstream country including china and myanmar so here uh, the bds uh, will be implemented uh, by the following actors uh, bds uh, will implement six core river basin management functions especially including uh, function related to data acquisitions, uh, exchange and monitoring of the river basins. And then the second functions will include analysis, modeling and assessments. And all of this uh, uh, function, core function number one, number two, will fit into basin planning to develop the more proactive regional planning. And then uh, also, the functions will include also forecasting, warning, and emergency, especially on flood and drought uh, monitoring. And then uh, number five, uh, to implement the MRC procedure, the five procedure, including prior consultation process. And then finally, uh, the, the last function is to focus on dialogue and cooperations uh, across the entire basins among the member country and, and stakeholder. Here, how do we implement the uh, basin development strategy? The BDS will be implemented by the following actor through various mechanisms, especially through expert groups. We have established expert group in the basin and uh, we will work further with the upstream country, China and Myanmar to improve the in engagements of the upstream country in the joint expert groups. And also through the regional stakeholder forums, we organize uh, two, uh, two times per year uh, on, this, on this to uh, discuss the uh, products of the MRC and again get inputs from uh, stakeholders. And then we will promote this uh, through the uh, memorandum of understandings, especially with the upstream country and development partner. And also uh, we will work on the development of the Mekong Fund, et cetera. So uh, here the MRC uh, implements the BDS through its five-year strategic plans. That is every five years we, we uh, uh, develop and, and implement. Now we have the strategic plan for 2021 and 2025. With the, uh, at the national levels, the National Mekong Committee, uh, including the NMC Secretariat and Line Agency, Line Agency will implement the national initiative plan we call NIPS. And uh, through the regional organizations and mechanisms, we uh, partner and work with ASEAN, with Mekong Langsang uh, Center, with GMS, uh, and also other initiatives, including the LMI, Lower Mekong Initiative. Uh, now it's called uh, US-Mekong US uh, Partnerships. Mekong Korean Initiative and also Mekong Japan, etc. For the private sector, we work uh, mostly related to uh, development opportunity, in, including the uh, hydropower sector, uh, irrigation sector, etc. Navigations. With CSO, we uh, work uh, mostly uh, with the prior consultation process of the uh, inf water infrastructure project like hydropower and also uh, formulations and implementation of, of MRC guideline. And also uh, uh, cooperate with uh, some of the research uh, institute organizations, especially also with International Water uh, uh, Management Institute, uh, and also uh, cooperate and, and implement also uh, through media uh, as well. 
So this uh, will be uh, uh, the way how we strengthen cooperations among all countries and, and stakeholders to implement our basin development strategy. So that's all uh, with my quick presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Lee, for such stepping in at the last moment and being giving such a comprehensive and clear analysis of the Mekong River Commission's strategy for the next five years. It's very clearly displayed. I like the red, yellow and green arrows, which make it very clear. And I'm also pleased that well-being is also part of the strategy, sometimes with the economy, biodiversity and so on. The well-being of the people around and especially the poorest people is often forgotten. So thank Thank you of your subject and we'll hear you soon in the discussion as well. You're watching the third round table of the AFD conference. This one is looking at the Mekong River um, and its biodiversity and um, its tra uh, transition as it transitions um, into cleaner energy and looking towards avoiding climate change. My name is Remy Windham. I'm your moderator for this session, and we are looking forward to your questions. So if you click on the questions and write down what you're getting inspired to ask by listening to our brilliant team of speakers, then we will be able to hopefully use your questions at the end of this discussion. But first, our final speaker before the discussion starts, our final speaker is Jake Brunner, Jake is head of the Indo-Burma Group at IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Jake will look at nature-based solutions for preserving the Mekong. He'll be explaining some concrete methods for preserving biodiversity in the Mekong Basin. And he'll talk about his work that he's doing together with the MCR, the Mekong River Commission, whom we've just heard from. So Jake, I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. And I, um, I think I have one, one slide to, to show. My, my intervention really um, picks up on uh, Tim Lee's presentation, particularly the slide he showed showing the, uh, the uh, Basin Development Strategy 2021-2025 uh, with its five strategic priorities. And I, and I like to think that what I'm going to say also um, perhaps connects to Carl's rather provocative, interesting point about the rights of rivers. Um, I think there may be an interesting um, relationship there. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to uh, discuss the BDS, the MRC's Basin Development Strategy, because I feel that there's, there's a, it reflects in, in, in I believe, a, a rather fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of the Mekong. Now, let me be clear, I'm a big fan of the MLC. They got fantastic technical expertise that we all benefit from. But I, I, I'm, I'm genuinely concerned uh, to the extent that um, the BDS with its five strategic priorities is uh, essentially it's a misunderstanding of the nature of the Mekong. And I'll explain why. The five priorities are presented, if you like, as somewhat independent. In other words, you can have, for example, uh, inclusive access and use of water. Uh, you can have optimal development independent of the first priority, priority number one, which is to maintain the ecological function of the Mekong. I would argue, and I'll do my best to do so, that if you achieve priority one, you go a very long way to delivering on priorities two, three, four, and five. And that's what I've shown, tried to show at least in the, in the table in front of you. So on the left are the five priorities. And then the right column is how maintaining the, the ecological integrity, ecosystem functions of the Mekong contribute to the other four. So for example, I'm just gonna go through them quickly. Um, Maintaining the integrity of the Mekong contributes to inclusive access and water use. And that's, that's self-evident. You know, for millennia, the Mekong has nourished agriculture and fisheries. And these are synchronized with the flood pulse. 
there's an important point, which I'll mention again. The Mekong does not suffer violent, unexpected river, uh, floods. It is not the Red River or the Yellow River or the Yangtze. It is, if not globally unique, certainly unique in this part of the, of the world, that it has a flood pulse, a powerful but predictable flood pulse that delivers sediment and water and nutrients. And that's what uh, explains um, the incredible food production. I mean, despite decades of, of you know, turmoil in this part of the world, uh, in the Mekong Mekong Basin, food production has never been a problem. And today, Thailand and Vietnam are number one and number two in the world's leading rice exporters. Next, how does maintaining the integrity of the Mekong River contribute to optimal and sustainable development? There are various ways of, of, of answering that, but fundamentally, it's the incredible fish production. So the Ton Nisap, in the mid heart of Cambodia, produces more fish, more freshwater fish, than all the fisheries in North America. So I'm adding, I think that's particularly US and Canada. I mean, that's, a, that's an extraordinary uh, comparison to make. Um, but it is, and it's driven by this, 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 this flood pulse that delivers the nutrients and the, and the water uh, that drives the productivity. Thirdly, how does maintaining the integrity of the Mekong uh, enhance climate change resilience? Well, I've done a sort of back of the envelope calculation. And if you, if you add the amount of extra water that the Mekong, that the Tonle Sap absorbs during the wet season and the, low, and the lower Mekong Delta floodplain, it comes to about 25% of the entire Mekong annual discharge. So these areas uh, serve as massive sponges, basically, absorbing rain during the wet and releasing it during the dry. And that is a powerful, powerful mitigator against climate change, and particularly changes in, in hydrology. And lastly, how does maintaining the integrity of the Mekong uh, contribute to, to regional transboundary cooperation? Um, I think it is self well it is increasingly clear the disagreements over how the mekong is used um serve as flashpoints and and disagreements amongst the countries um this has been really well documented over the last 10 to 15 years basically ever since the saiburi was proposed and it remains a major bone of contention different countries have different different demands on the mekong and many of those can be accommodated uh but but many can't now just to finish off, I'm not talking hypothetical here. Let's look at the Mekong Delta, the Vietnamese portion of the Mekong Delta, as a case study and what happens when you start to mess around with the Mekong. Starting at about 2000, accelerating in around 2010, in the upper delta uh, of the upper Mekong Delta, the Vietnamese government started to build these huge ring dikes. And they did that to be able to grow three rice crops a year. It's a process not of intensification, but sort of hyper-intensification. It's been a disaster in terms of economy, in terms of fisheries, in terms of uh, flood risk. And in 2017, the government reversed policy and issued a, 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 a party resolution that basically set the basis for a more natural uh, water and land use in the Delta. I don't have time to go into details, perhaps during the question during the Q&A, but uh, the power, if you like, of nature was revealed very clearly uh, in that experience. I'll stop there. Thank you. That was fantastic, Jake. It was so passionate and powerful. And reading between the lines, what you're saying is nature knows best, leave it to nature. And if we start to intervene and do things like ring dikes and so on, we actually ruin what's there. But the uh, question, I mean, we're now into the questions for all of you, and you might like to discuss this. The, the danger is that if we get complacent, um, you, you very well pointed out that uh, there are big sponges for growing um, around the Mekong and that uh, it's powerful against climate change, that food production is flourishing, rice is flourishing, and that they have enormous amounts of fish around Cambodia, much more even than in the US and Canada. So I have two questions. Firstly, 
Jake, can this last? Won't the fish possibly also suffer if there's either over-industrialization, pollution, poverty, uh, or any other uh, unforeseen natural disaster? And secondly, from what you say, if we really left everything to nature, um, wouldn't that really also create its own problems? Let me answer the second question first. No, I think it's an inc <laughs> the Mekong has been around for a long time and it's a, it's a powerful natural force um, that has sustained civilizations and generations in, the, in these countries. Um, it's done an enormous and it continues to do an enormous amount of good in terms of power and food security and, and, and culture. Um, so I don't think we have to worry about the Mekong. It'll take care of itself, it's allowed to. Now it is suffering severe stresses and these basically were suffering, really I would say, perhaps in a way I wouldn't, even five years ago, the impacts of climate change are, are increasingly evident. Um, we've had serious prolonged droughts in 2016, 2019 and 2020. This looks as though it's going to be the new normal. But again, so, allowing the Mekong, if you like, to, to absorb and then release water is probably the cheapest way to offset those, those impacts. Um, there are issues of localized pollution. Um, there's, I would, my last point is that capture fisheries is an area um, where of tremendous opportunities for improvement. Mm -hmm. Carl was talking earlier about Northern Thailand. There's some fantastic examples there of fish, fish conservation areas, locally managed kind of mini marine protected areas that just you know, hugely increase the, the volume and the diversity and the value of fish. So there are steps that could be done uh, to substantially improve capture fisheries in particular. Um, there is also issues, as uh, uh, Tim Lee said, about discussions with China in particular about um, how the Lansang uh, Dam cascade is managed in ways that don't disrupt the annual flood pulse. Thank you. Thank you for explaining, Jake. I can see that Lee is nodding. Um, Lee, <laughs> because you're, the Mekong River Commission is doing a huge amount of work to try and mitigate a lot of the things that Jake says could be done more naturally, could allow nature maybe to take its own course. So how do you steer the right route with your commission and not over interfere? Okay, let me, yeah. Thank you, Jack. Uh, I think Jack uh, provided excellent uh, presentations, uh, uh, especially uh, taking the BDS uh, on board and uh, highlighting some of the missing connections. And actually, uh, during our formulation of the BDS, uh, we have these five dimensions, and all of these five dimensions are linked. So, link between environment, social economics, uh, climate change, and operations. So, all of them link. And Climate change is cross-cutting, cooperation uh, is also cross-cutting. So uh, all of these are, are, are linked in our work. Now uh, I agree also with uh, Jack, uh, as well in terms of the uh, uh, natural conditions and uh, uh, in terms of intervention, interventions, it also uh, has some issue. Uh, so uh, in our work, we uh, under, under the priority number three, we will carry out a proactive regional planning. So what does it mean, proactive regional planning? Proactive regional planning means that we have to uh, assess and do the plan, uh, not, not, not doing, uh, doing first and correct later. So this is uh, not good. Doing first, uh, correct later is not good. So uh, we need to have a good plan. And this needs uh, assessment. And this, we, we, we need to also look now, there is an issue you see in the status flow, uh, issue on flow, so we, we need to identify a flow threshold, so uh, maybe minimum flow into the Tunle Sap Lake. So ensure that the flow is 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 is, is go into Tunle Sap uh, uh, based on the season uh, time also. Mm -hmm. So this we need to we need to identify and uh, and put a, a flow on, on threshold and agreed by member country, especially uh, to to have uh, enough flow from upstream. Uh, environmental limit uh, we need to also uh, see which uh, wetlands uh, that we need to preserve. Uh, flat plains that we need to uh, preserve uh, and then uh, identify also some of the uh, 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 identify some of the, the, the options that we, we can establish 
uh, especially uh, using existing uh, natural and constructed uh, water storage. So uh, natural means flat plain, right? And constructed storage, uh, let's see uh, if there is any potentials that, that we also can do uh, with, with green gray or, or gray green uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, structure, uh, not, not, not purely uh, uh, gray. But it has to be green also. Uh, so nature-based solution should should be uh, included. And this we work uh, to reduce the sediment de depletions, which is required by also by the ecosystem and fisheries, etc. And also we still we still uh, have uh, this uh, energy uh, uh, support energy uh, as well. So so all of this uh, is concept of of what we are doing on proactive regional planning uh, during this. Uh, BDS uh, period. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. You you did mention that um, you weren't you should not put into plans into operation any plan that you subsequently regret, which is quite right. But how do you do this? Because the example that Jake gave of the huge ring dike um, that was trying to give three crops of rice a year in Vietnam and then ultimately failed and caused disasters and floods and so on, the Mekong River Commission must have seen that this plan was happening in Vietnam. So how come that they allowed it to go through? That's, that's correct. So uh, this is uh, what we, we have learned uh, from the experience. So uh, for, for basin planning, we, we need to take this into account and uh, uh, to, to avoid uh, doing first and correct later. So we need a better assessment. And better assessment, we, we, it means that we need information. We need data. So uh, uh, lesson learned experience that Jack presented, it could be a very good example to build this uh, regional planning uh, 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 better, uh, 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 better you. products for the basin. Um, Actually, what you were saying, thank you, Lee, what uh, you were saying, Carl, about the um, rights of rivers, um, can you expand a bit on that and also show how perhaps if we paid more attention to the rights of rivers, none of these uh, wrong decisions would be taken in the first place? Oh, very good question. Thank you very much, Rene. Um, I mean, to connect it, I think, first to the foundation of the discussion that we're having, um, we haven't really addressed the relationship between people and every other living thing and the, the relative ethical standing of each. So I think the fundamental part of a rights of nature approach is to actually give more um, independent value to non-human living things and entire systems. That means that we wouldn't really be seeing the trade-off in a way of equivalent things like social environment and economic growth, but rather similar to the way that we think about human rights as being inseparable from being human and essentially the basis of a, a fundamental protection of people, the same would be held for nature. So I think actually a rights of nature approach opens up a, a very different ethical foundation for these types of discussion, because it actually really asks questions about the existence of other species aside from our own. But then to connect it to the discussion that we've just had, this is not then non-human centric because I, I actually strongly agree with what Jake said. Human life depends upon the biodiversity that exists in the environment around us. It's not separate from that. And it's kind of often, I mean, for those that are increasingly living in cities, we may feel more disconnected from that relationship. The distances, for example, between a large hydropower dam, the changes that happen on the Mekong River and, and the consumption of that electricity, it kind of hides away what's happening. And so maybe oh, just a wider awareness would be enough, and, or at least a starting point. And so in terms of a rights of nature discussion, it actually has to start with a recognition of the way that humans are relating to nature at present. And this may sound abstracted at first, but I think what's missing here is like the future's literacy, the ability of that we, the way that we teach, the way that we educate, the way that and the current generations think about their responsibilities towards nature. So although it may be a bit of a cliche to start from this point, actually working with youth is a really important starting point. They will be the next generation long after we are no longer here. So I think discussions start there. There's very interesting uh, initiative, for example, by UNESCO at present about uh, future studies and future literacy. And the invitation in that way of thinking is 
let's actually really think about the future and how to get to a desirable one. And in many of the kind of practical, pragmatic discussions that exist around the types of issue we're discussing at present, that ambition for the future is not really addressed enough, in my opinion. Very succinct and clear, Carl. Thank you. Inspiring. In fact, I'd like to stay on this theme for a while. Jake, how do you, um, how close do you feel to the idea of rights of nature rather than letting nature take its course? Where's the fine line between the two? I think in, in, in societies across the world, to a greater or less extent, you know, for the last 150 years, we've been trying to dominate nature, control nature, manipulate nature. And time and time again, we, we, we realize that it's a battle. You know, you can win, you can win battles, but you'll lose the war. Nature has incredible ability to, to, to push back. Um, so I, I, just in the case of the Mekong, I think um, specifically, I think a lot of the thinking, you hear a lot, even I must say within the MRC, of flood control. It's the mantra that's always rolled out whenever you're talking about what, need, what, what needs to happen to the, to the Mekong. It's flood control, it's flood control, it's flood control. A lot of these people were trained, perhaps the previous generation, in Moscow and Beijing as, as dam builders and hydrological engineers. So that's their training. That's, that's what they know. When they see a river, the question is how, how, how quickly can you, can you control it? How much concrete can you build? And that's exactly what happened in Vietnam after reunification in 1976. So all of the water engineers came down from, from, from Hanoi and started to talk about dikes and flooding. And they brought with them a word called lu, which is a northern word for a bad flood. And when they started talking about the word lu in the south, people said, what do you mean? What is a bad flood? If we don't have a flood, we die. <laughs> no fish, no rice. So there is, if you like, a, a, a clash um, that, that comes from people's training um, the political economy, I would say, we haven't really discussed, but there's a power, there's a powerful vested interest in in concrete. In the, in the in the Delta, we call it the concrete mafia. It's been well documented, um, and so I think we've got our our, our work cut out here. I, I love. I'm really intrigued by Carl's thinking, and 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 Tim Lee is a, you know, speaks with such human nature about the, their work and avoiding, you know, trying to do your best to avoid these mistakes. But it's it's not an even playing field. It's I, you know we need to work together. Absolutely, I think this we're actually getting closer together with the three of you as we speak. And Lee, you might have still been trained in the way that Jake was saying in learning about flood control. Was that part of your training? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a. Uh... Yeah, now now actually we yeah we, we used to uh, work on this and uh, heard this a lot. Uh, Jack is right. Uh, now now we are moving also. Uh, I think based on the lesson learned, now we are moving also to capture nature-based solutions. So nature-based solutions. So we need to also protect nature, right? We need to consider what uh, uh, we should do. Uh, so it's some for uh, preserve of the flat plains uh, for, for 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 flat for flat and storage natural storage, and also maybe uh, uh, flood management, uh, including the uh, uh, building some of the uh, green uh, or technolo green technologies to, to protect flood. Uh, yeah, so so uh, more, more in a way, not, not, not uh, to like uh, uh, fully on the uh, 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 structure, but, but it, it's more on a nature-based solution. So that's that what we, we, we try to achieve in, in, in the BDS in our... Uh, That's business. very consoling. I think just hearing how you're all approaching each other is, is uh, quite encouraging. Um, but uh, is the MRC as relevant uh, in the region as you would like? I mean, how can you make your sustainable solution policy strong enough in the region for a coherent feeling amongst all the countries surrounding the Mekong? Uh, Lee. Yeah, so uh, our work is that we, uh, uh, when we do uh, now with this proactive regional planning, we uh, uh, have to do uh, new assessments, especially on what government have planned. And then what are the, the plan, what are the projects that the government have not considered? 
So a, a new projects that we have to identify, like uh, maybe uh, the government may may not think of 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 other alternative or options. So so we need we need to identify different options. And how do we do this? Uh, maybe we need also uh, participations of stakeholders. So like Jack, like Cars, are also providing advice on 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 this uh, planning uh, process uh, on this issue, uh, nature based and also uh, human rights as well, uh, economic development. So we need to work all together. So this, in order to do this, I think we need uh, a, joint, uh, a joint hands uh, of, of all stakeholders and, and experts to, to share. So that's, that's the thing. And then we need to uh, have like this also, we need negotiations, uh, negotiation uh, between governments also uh, to uh, accept and, and agree, agree on the, uh, some of the options that, that we would like to uh, complement to, to put on for the complement of, of the national uh, projects. Yeah. I wish the national governments would be as uh, cooperative as the three of you when they were discussing. This is uh, quite, quite fruitful. Um, Carl, how does um, uh, the prob uh, point that Jake raised a little earlier, but I'd like to ask you really, there are so many vested interests in concrete. I mean, certainly around the Mekong, in fact, around a lot of the problem in the world that is ruining biodiversity. So how does the right, how do you, with the rights of nature, counteract this uh, vested interest in concrete? A uh, nice, tricky question. And um, <laughs> there's no silver bullet for an answer, to be honest. Um, I mean, I think some of the issues have already been touched on by, by Dr. Lee about the way of problematizing and identifying other options in the way that planning has taken place at present. I mean, I think partly some of the work is maybe with researchers to kind of, to reveal the politics and the political economy and the interest behind particular projects and agendas. Um, I think related to that, we probably have to shift our thinking a little bit from a focus on technical solutions alone, or thinking about technology as being the solution, to always seeing technology as within its social context. So I think what that means is that when we see technology as always being a part of an agenda of those that would like to see the technology happen, then it kind of reveals why certain technologies are being pushed forward and other ones are not really being discussed. And I understand from your previous panel discussion, for example, that you explored different types of energy options. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that would be an example of why certain types of energy solutions come to the fore. So for example, is there such a thing as clean coal? Does that technology really exist? Sustainable hydropower, what does sustainable hydropower as a technology really look like versus the primarily private sector interests that lie behind this. And it, this is where we need to then actually think about the role of the state and the role of the private sector and why, why they act in the way they do. Um, I do think, so th this is probably my main suggestion, but then I think what that implies in terms of a broader discussion, maybe relating it to Dr. Lee's um, emphasis on planning, that we need to shift the discussion from the focus on the quantity of economic growth to the quality of economic growth. And you know, that's a really big discussion in itself, but it's happening globally, not just in relation to water, but in relation to globalization, economic crisis, climate change, and so on. One of the very practical um, steps in that is the role of regulation and especially the role of impact assessment tools uh, that Dr. Lee mentioned. So, environmental impact assessments, transboundary EIAs, and especially strategic environmental assessments, because strategic environmental assessments talk about plans at a very early stage, predict potential scenarios, and then open up a wider discussion. So I think actually all of these tools are already being used and they need to be used more and better and more perhaps independently than the interests of those that are involved in the planning themselves. So I, I think that these types, like, as Dr. Lee was mentioning, like knowledge is really important. Like knowledge, knowing what could happen, what is happening and what could happen. And these tools, I think, are a part of the solution. Um, then to relate it back to the rights of nature at the very end, that would be an underpinning value about the different scenarios that could emerge from those, um, from those, the use of those tools. 
Thank you very much, Carl. I am sorry that we're running out of time because I was going to also discuss the, what it does for poorer people and whether their priorities about biodiversity would be the same when they're worrying about putting food in their mouths and feeding their families. But maybe we'll have a chance to discuss that at another date. But uh, this has been absolutely amazingly fruitful from all three of you. And I'm interested in the way that you come from different angles, but there's a lot that you also agree on, on the quality of uh, protecting nature and the way nature behaves and putting nature more at the forefront of the way that we look at the Mekong, not just uh, economic terms, as you were saying. Thank you so much, for you, the audience, for watching us patiently across Europe, across Southeast Asia and across other parts of the world and uh, for your questions as well, some of which I fed into the discussion. Thank you to, to our great bunch of speakers who I thoroughly enjoyed talking to. To you, Carl, to Lee for coming in at the last moment and being terrific, and to Jake as well with very fresh ideas. So many constructive ideas from you. And to the great support act, whom you can't see, but our technicians, our organization team, and our backstage moderators are there keeping the show on the road. We're now going to take another 15 minute break and do return promptly, or if you want, just have, sit by your computer and have a nice cold glass of water. My colleague and good friend Karen Coleman will be leading our final roundtable discussion on how to make sure that each person has equal access to environmental justice in Southeast Asia. So now take a brief rest. We look forward to you returning with renewed energy for our final discussion from all the team here who've been amazing and from me, Rena Windham, see you in 15 minutes. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very much. Me. Thank you. Thank you, team. You've been super. Thank you so much. Uh, are we? Hi, Charlotte and Louise. It's Karen here. I just have my camera off. Um, so I see we have Georgina. Hello, Georgina. Can, can you hear me? It's Karen here. And we have Jean Philippe. Excellent. And we have Christina. Excellent. Okay. I'll Hi. just Karen. <laughs> there we go. I'll just join you visually. So we're all here together. Very good. Excellent. Jean-Philippe, hello, I'm Karen. Um, I'm going to be moderating this session. Just to let you know, it's still streaming. So everything, um, if anybody is still watching, they can obviously see and hear us. Um, so I'm just only going to stick with some logistical issues. Um, so you're all very welcome. Are you all comfortable with your setup, with your lines? Um, good, good morning, everyone. I'm very comfortable with uh, I can see you and I can hear you. So that it's all right for me. Just right now, someone, sometimes it can <laughs> be difficult due to the quality of the line, but I, I think it's all right just right now. Uh, Jean-Philippe, don't worry. It's, it's the nature of the virtual conferencing yeah. that we engage in. Some My own line went down yesterday for couldn't figure it out. I have a very good broadband connection, but okay. um, the system kicked me off. So don't worry this, you know, I mean, it, it's the nature of, of this. If, <laughs> if it happens, if any of your lines go, um, I, I will just move on to the next speaker and, and just reconnect and make sure you just click the participation button again All and right. I'll bring you back in if any of those, um, if any of those things happen. So, um, just, I just wanted to reconnect just to check that you're all okay uh, with the format. So the, the plan is we're going to start at 10.30. So Rini, Rini Winton, the wonderful Rini Winton, who's been yes, moderating. <laughs> and there she is behind the scenes. She hasn't left us. Rini is going to welcome everybody back at 10.30 or 11.30. Sorry, 
<laughs> I'm on Irish I know time. I'm getting muddled as well. Yes. Um, and I know it's 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 afternoon for many of the rest of you elsewhere. Um, so Rini is going to come in as the MC, welcome everybody back. And then she'll throw uh, to me and then I'll take over from there. Um, and then I will just briefly introduce, give some context to this topic. Um, and then I will I will introduce all of you. I'll just give you a one line introduction to begin with and then a more detailed one with just a few more lines when I go to you individually. But the plan is that I will then go once I've given each one of you uh, an introduction. I'll go to you first, Georgina, and then I'll go to you, Jean-Philippe, and to you, Christina, for a more considered response to the, to the question that is posed in this roundtable debate. Um, and that is how can the inequality that, it, that exists in the access to law and justice be addressed in the region of Southeast Asia? So I'm going to be asking you for your opening views on, on that question, the one that's the key to this uh, round table. And then, so if you can keep your opening remarks to, you know, between seven to maximum of 10 minutes, please. And then that will give us um, another half an hour once you all have finished about, you know, between 30 to maybe 20 minutes to take some questions if we do have them from the audience. And if not, of course, I have questions that I will put you to. It would be great to get your interaction like Rini, that last round table was excellent. And the interaction between the panelists is always great. So jump in if any of you want to comment if you want to say something in response to maybe what somebody else has said, you know, raise your hand. That's the easiest way to indicate to me that you'd like to jump in. And I and that would be brilliant if you can do that. Um, so is that all OK? Are you happy with that before we, we start counting down to when we're starting, which will be in 10 minutes time from now? It sounds good, Karen. Thanks. Great. Uh, Christina, you're OK with that? Christina, yes, yep. you just said, actually. Georgina, are you OK with that? Grant okay. and Jean Philippe, are you OK with absolutely, that? Absolutely, I agree. Brilliant. OK, and just um, to check, Georgina, are you speaking without slides or do you have slides? No slides. Great. OK, Jean Philippe, what about no. you? No. Never, never slides. <laughs> okay. Very because good. People, people don't know what to put in. I know, I know. And, and and always it's another logistical headache to deal with that sometimes would be better off without. And Georgina, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Christina, what about you? No slides. OK, fine. So we have about um, eight minutes to go. You can either keep your you probably the best thing is keep your mics on mute. Um, until I actually go to you for your opening remarks. But once we open, please have your videos on so we're all on screen together. Um, so my advice to you now is probably to mute yourselves um, and then you can keep your, your, your screens on unless you want to have some privacy until we start at 10.30 or at 11.30 French time. And maybe just a quick note, uh, when you move the slide or change the layout, it changes for everyone. So uh, please uh, refrain from uh, moving it, uh, at least right now, because we need to keep the coffee break slide to, so that people understand that the next session hasn't started yet. Thank you.
Hello and welcome back. And we now come to the fourth of our round tables, sadly the last of our two-day conference of the AFD, the Agence France de Développement. This will be about how to protect poorer populations from environmental <coughs> degradation, <coughs> sorry, and how to make this work fairly for everyone. Karen Coleman is back to steer us smoothly through the next session, and she's poised to introduce our speakers. So I'm looking forward to hearing this one, Karen. Over to you. Thank you very much, Rini, and a big warm welcome to all those of you who are joining us online. If you weren't here earlier, you're very, very welcome to this conference. I'm Karen Coleman. I'm a journalist and broadcaster from Ireland, and I specialize in EU and international issues, and I have the pleasure of moderating this very interesting final roundtable session of this conference, which is on the very important topic of environmental and climate justice, and how can we ensure access to it by everyone in the region of Southeast Asia. And just to put this theme in context, um, beyond its power to regulate control and prevent environmental damage, justice also plays, of course, an essential role in protecting individual rights and at the same time in reminding public authorities and the private sector of existing laws and the resulting obligations that they have to adhere to it in that regard. And in, although everyone is entitled to this protection, inequalities in access to the law and to justice still persist. We know that vulnerable populations are frequently the first victims of the effects of climate change and environmental degradation. Yet, despite that, many of them find it difficult to have their voices heard and to assert their rights. So how can this inequality to access to the law and to justice be addressed? They are the questions we will be teasing out during this final roundtable discussion. <clears throat> I'm going to very briefly introduce our three excellent guests for it, and then I'm going to go to each one of them for their opening views on that topic. So very quickly, we're joined by Georgina Lloyd, the Regional Coordinator of Asia and the Pacific for Environmental Law and Governance with the United Nations Environment Programme. Our second speaker is Jean-Philippe Riveau. He is the General Substitute of the General Attorney at the Paris Court of Appeal in France. And our third and final panelist is Christina Pack, the Environmental Justice Programme Manager with the Asian Development Bank. You're all very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to go to you first, Georgina. Um, as I said, you're the Regional Coordinator of Asia and the Pacific for Environmental Law and Governance with the United Nations Environment Programme. Georgina joined the UNEP Regional Office after spending 12 years in Cambodia. And during her time in Southeast Asia, <clears throat> Excuse me, Georgina has been involved in capacity building for environmental law within the region. And she's also provided advice to the government and non government stakeholders on environmental law and policy issues. Georgina, you are very welcome to this conference, to this final round table. And if we can go to you now first for your views on how inequality in access to the law and to justice in the region can be addressed. Over to you. Thank you very much, Karen, and thank you to AFD for convening this roundtable and the invitation to participate. I'm really delighted to join uh, this fantastic panel. So I want to start by further framing the discussion and some of the foundational issues around access to justice in environmental matters. Um, as you mentioned in the introduction, Environmental and climate justice is linked to the fact that certain groups are disproportionately affected by the impacts of environmental harm, including those related to climate change. The effects of biodiversity loss, pollution and climate change often have disproportionate effects on groups of populations, for example, women, children and youth, indigenous peoples and local communities. 
many of whom rely directly on access to natural resources, often have limited contribution to environmental harm, but and who often contribute the least to greenhouse gas emissions. This inequality in this situation raises questions con and concerning environmental and climate justice. Environmental justice includes issues of distributive justice and these disproportionate impacts of pollution, biodiversity loss and climate change on children, youth and future generations. So there are issues of both intergenerational but as also intragenerational equity. There are also issues of justice related to access to lands, territories and resources and impacts on cultures, traditional knowledge and sacred belief systems. And I think some of these elements tie in quite nicely with the, um, the previous round table that, that touched on some of these concerns. Environmental justice seeks to address inequalities within all environmental and climate action. And as such, environmental justice requires that actions and solutions are grounded in human rights, equality and non-discrimination and include the participation of those who are most affected. So when we talk about the challenges of environmental justice, they are linked to these issues of human rights, effective environmental rule of law and governance. So the challenges and the opportunities of access to environmental justice are tied equally to upholding human rights and advancing environmental rule of law. I'm gonna expand a little bit further upon this, drawing on UNEP's global assessment on environmental rule of law and an issue brief that was prepared earlier this year on human rights and environmental rule of law. And I can share uh, links to these resources, I think through the, the chat function or through the question function. So it's well understood now that environmental harm threatens the effective enjoyment of a broad range of human rights for individuals, peoples and communities across Asia Pacific. Environmental harm and climate change threaten fundamental substantive rights. It's the rights to life, to health, to shelter, to food, water, among others. And of course, there is the right to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. These contribute to a body of environmental rights. And access to justice is a core pillar of environmental rights within the body of procedural or access rights. It sits alongside access to information and public participation. These procedural rights, as they relate to environmental decision making, are found within Principle 10 of the 1992 Rio Declaration on Environment and Development. And of course, they're the subject matter of two very important agreements. Uh, the 1998 Convention on Access to Information, Public Participation in Decision Making and Access to Justice in Environmental Matters, also known more simply as the Aarhus Convention. And then we have the 2018 Latin American and Caribbean Agreement on Access to Information, Public Participation and Access to Justice in Environmental Matters, known as the Escazú Agreement. And these two agreements are quite important when we look at opportunities in, in this region, which I'll touch on in a little bit. So access to justice is an avenue through which substantive environmental rights may be upheld. Uh, and so this is also important when we look at our opportunities. So states implementation of procedural rights obligations, including obligations to assess and provide information about, for example, the effects of climate change, to ensure that climate decisions are made with the informed participation of the public and to provide for effective remedies for climate related violations of human rights are also remain the key challenges of climate justice. A simple example of an injustice is when an environmental or climate action is determined through governance processes that may not include the voices and address the rights and needs of all groups of society. Um, and the implementation and promotion of these procedural rights, including, of course, access to justice, are essential to enable the right to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. So effective environmental rule of law ensures that procedural rights can be realized. And this is one of our core opportunities. Environmental rule of law integrates environmental needs with the essential elements of rule of law and provide the basis for improving environmental governance. 
So environment rule of law provides a foundation for environment rights and obligations to be exercised. And by doing so would improve access to justice. Without environment rule of law, the enforcement of legal rights and obligations, environmental governance, and indeed access to justice may be discretionary, subjective, and unpredictable. So there's a positive link between a guarantee of environmental rights and improved environment performance. So the question remains, how does environmental law ensure access to justice? Well, within many environmental laws and multilateral environmental agreements, uh, such as the Aarhus Convention, the Escazú Agreement that I referenced, we find environmental justice principles, such as intergenerational equity, precautionary principle, free, prior and informed consent, and the preventative approach amongst others. So MEAs such as Aarhus Convention and Escazú Agreement represent the result of global and regional consensus building around environmental matters and the defining of common goals to advance environmental rule of law and human rights based approaches to environmental decision making. And this is really the key to enabling access to justice. So in environmental laws can provide this basis for enabling access to justice. They can, for example, set out provisions for public interest litigation within environmental protection laws. Such opportunities for public interest litigation can advance environmental rights and can open opportunities for access to justice. Furthermore, the, the right to a healthy environment is legally recognized in more than 80% of UN member states through either constitutions, legislation, court decisions, or regional treaties. In this Southeast Asian region, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, and Philippines all provide constitutional rights to a healthy environment. These rights have enabled citizens to bring cases, calling upon governments and other actors to ensure environmental protection. A quick example is a landmark case just last month in Indonesia, where the Central Jakarta District Court offered officials, or ordered rather, ordered officials to tighten national air quality standards so that they are, and I quote, sufficient to protect human health, the environment and ecosystems, including the health of sensitive populations based on science and technology. Of course, there do remain some challenges to ensuring access to justice. However, by advancing rights-based approaches and environment rule of law, we can ensure a sustainable future for people and the planet. UNEP is doing this by providing technical legal assistance to member states and working with legal stakeholders. We work to increase recognition and the promotion and protection of these rights, including procedural rights. And this involves ensuring that legal instruments such as the constitutional rights, the rights found in, in legislation uh, that are relevant to access rights are implemented together with tools and mechanisms to improve the understanding and access to environmental justice for environmental human rights defenders, particularly, but also for all groups, for vulnerable groups, including children and youth, women and indigenous peoples. Uh, we work quite closely with the Asian Development Bank on judicial capacity building, and I think this is something that Christina is going to elaborate on further. So there are many opportunities to further this work, and, and critical to that is partnerships, partnerships with all stakeholders, and, and in doing so, reinforcing these core elements of human rights-based approaches and environmental rule of law. So thank you very much, and back to you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Georgina. Very interesting points made there and some that I'd like to tease out with you once we get to the Q&A panel part. Um, but thank you very much. And by the way, if you have questions for Georgina and indeed our next two speakers as well, please fire them in through the question channel on your live storm screen and um, I'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Jean-Philippe Riveau. Uh, Jean-Philippe is the General Substitute of the General Attorney at the Paris Court of Appeal in France. He is also the co-founder and president of the Association of Magistrates for Environmental Law and Environmental Health Law. Jean-Philippe, you are very welcome to our virtual stage and over to you for your views on that opening topic of this roundtable number four. Over to you. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much, Karen. And um, I think that there is a there, there is a problem with my my camera because uh, from my side it works perfectly, but I'm not sure that you that you can see me. It's okay, so, so I'll jump in here, Jean Philippe. We can see you at the moment, but don't worry. Oh, good, good. You, good. we can hear you perfectly, and if the team behind the scenes can get your okay. camera, I working. don't know why. I don't know why, really, because from my side it works perfectly. Okay, but, um, don't, don't worry about it, because if if deliver your presentation as you would, because we can hear you perfectly, okay. and then okay. we might that's, try that, and that's, yeah, that's the most ahead. important. That's the most important because I'm not so young, so that is not important that you can see me. <laughs> that's <okay>. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, let me just um, give you a few details about my my personal presentation. Uh, actually, I'm actually I'm a deputy general prosecutor at the Court of Appeal of Paris. Uh, I was a judge in the past and I'm specializing in environmental law, criminal law, and I'm also the, the vice president of the European Network of Prosecutors for the Environment, which which has been founded 10 years ago in Brussels, and also. Uh, the president of the newly created association, society, French society of judges and prosecutors for the environment, because I know that in your countries it's very different of what um, of our model, judges and prosecutors uh, are all members of the judiciary. That's very different in some other countries. Uh, I think it was necessary to, to, to explain that. Then um, my, 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 my views today, my, my presence and my participation, let me, let me uh, first thank your, uh, the FAD, ADB, etc. for this invitation. And then my, my participation um, will really consist in uh, 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 sharing my views as a practitioner uh, on, on the ground uh, of uh, my views of the judges and the prosecutors. Because actually, uh, as uh, you, you, the, the, the title of this round table is ensuring access to environmental justice, that's, uh, on my view, on our view, the most important topic in uh, environmental issues. How can we access to justice? Why? Because uh, the, the, the question, especially here with the the professors of law in the university, law schools, etc., they are discussing one important topic, which is effectiveness of environmental law. The effectiveness is very something very crucial. Uh, why? Uh, judges and prosecutors in France, but it's the same in all over Europe, and I think um, through my, my international experiences, I, when I'm, I'm, I'm talking with Brazilian prosecutors, with African prosecutors, Canadian prosecutors, we are all facing the same difficulties uh, regarding first um, the, the, the question of the, the, the knowledge on environmental law. Then the first question is, which is um, the legal framework? Uh, let's uh, know. Uh, let's re uh, know that we uh, need to know first that environmental law is a very, 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 very wide uh, uh, topic, and the sources, the sources of our, our, our environmental law are more than 500 international uh, agreements and treaties. And it means that the sources which have a huge impact on internal law, that's obvious, this is the principle, with so many sources, of course, uh, it's very difficult to implement and to enforce, uh, to enforce environmental law. Uh, then, um, Sorry, I have lost my 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 my, my paper, <laughs> so that it's coming back just in one minute. Uh, so, um, in in five hundred uh, international conventions, and in Europe, in in Europe, in the European Union, we also have many directives and uh, regulations, and uh, our intern French law, the the professors of law. The, in the university, used to say that uh, environmental environmental law 
is um, uh, obese loads so very 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 important and too much too important to be um, uh, enforced with efficiency uh, that's that's very important just uh, i can sh i can't show you unfortunately because the camera doesn't work i don't know why uh, show you our uh, code uh, of environment uh, but uh, Ah, I think we seem to have lost Jean Philippe. The gremlins are back again today. Um, so what we'll do is, while Jean Philippe is getting his line back on, and maybe he'll get his camera on as well because he his points are really really good. Christina, if I can go to you, I'm going to introduce Christina Pack now, the Environmental Justice Program Manager with the Asian Development Bank. And Christina specializes in international development finance and law and policy reform. She oversees a diverse portfolio in the areas of environmental protection and climate change, gender equality, private sector development, public private partnerships and digital economy. Christina, we're going to a little bit earlier ahead of schedule, yep. but if you wouldn't mind, if you could now address the central uh, question in this round table topic and then we'll go back to jan philippe after you have finished over to you christina no problem um thanks karen for that kind introduction um first of all it's, it's a privilege to be here and uh, i really like to thank our host afd in convening this really important round table um, i'm also grateful to our long-standing development partner unep um, for keeping the discourse on environmental and climate justice at the forefront, because it is a critical issue in the region. Um, and, you know, we all know what's at stake, um, you know, if we don't progress on the Earth's climate, environmental and biodiversity goals. Um, in fact, we can all feel the urgency and especially from uh, the vulnerable, the poor, the youths and the indigenous, indigenous communities that Georgie highlighted um, who are most affected by um, lack of environmental justice. Um, so, you know, where where do they turn to? And, um, you know, in appropriate, in, in getting the appropriate redress and, and, you know, what is the situation in Southeast Asia? So I'll, I'll talk about um, how this is playing out in the courts, um, really, because due to the inaction by governments and private parties um, and um, the urgency of the crisis that we're facing, um, numerous parties have been turning to the courts. So it's critical to ensure access to justice in the courts. So my talk will actually build on Georgie's uh, talk and um, focus on the challenges um, and the opportunities to increase access to justice in the courts. Um, and I think uh, Jean-Philippe was sort of uh, alluding to this and, and him being a former judge, um, you know, he could probably agree with me, but you know, one key way to, um, to provide, um, to increase access to justice is really to provide for strong and well-equipped judiciaries. And, and, you know, this is because how they adjudicate um, cases about environment, biodiversity and climate change um, and the outcome have huge implications in inclusive and sustainable development. Um, and these types of cases are often complex, um, require judges to possess technical know-how in multiple um, disciplines, including understanding the scientific basis for the law to adjudicate effectively. And also they need to understand the policy and the rationale. So it is a you know very complex area of law. So, you know, but the situation in, in Southeast Asia um, and also in uh, rest of Asia and the Pacific is that um, judges um, still lack um, expertise um, to effectively adjudicate these complex um, environmental cases and now emerging climate uh, cases for numerous reasons. Um, first, um, you know, I guess environmental law um, is still a bit nascent. Um, it's when they were in law school, they didn't, they didn't, there wasn't an environmental law, um, you know, class or curriculum. So um, when they have, they have, they're not specialists and they need to adjudicate, um, it's, it's, it's difficult to make the connections and the linkages between um, you know, environmental law, environmental degradation, and um, and and between um, sustainable development, biodiversity, and climate change. Um, second challenge is the is really the lack of technical expertise um, on the national level. We found that um, you know 
when we talk to the court authorities and also the um, judicial learning bodies like um, judicial schools and academies, um, there just isn't sufficient, sufficient capacity on the national level to help design um, and deliver the curriculum. And, um, you know, for example, we had um, consultations with the Cambodia court, court authorities and they said, you know, it would be helpful if um, academics, environmental academics can be trained up um, to actually provide, um, um, to be qualified to teach at the Royal School of Judges. Um, thirdly, um, environmental law judicial capacity building is often, you know, it, it's delivered in an ad hoc basis and it's not institutionalized or mainstreamed into the judicial education programs, um, even though judges are already already hearing um, these cases. Um, so it's important to get this into the curriculum, given that, um, you know, there's just so many um, um, environmental and climate cases coming coming before the, our judges. Um, also, there's the problem of the one size fits all approach to judicial education, um, you know, really need to be tailored for the different skill levels and also courts with different jurisdiction. Um, and um, another point, another challenge is uh, lack of access to national court, national laws and court decisions. Um, a lot of the decisions um, in Asia, in particular in Southeast Asia, uh, they're not shared or published. So judges need um, support with capturing some of the, the, their decisions and decision writing. And there's also um, a need uh, to access regional court judgments to see how other jurisdictions have dealt with certain environmental and climate change disputes. Um, my last point um, on, on the difficulties of um, it, or the challenges is that um, judges have difficulties in devising appropriate remedies for environment and climate change cases. And there needs to be, um, uh, you know, we need to do more to assist judges in this uh, in this space. Um, and in fact, um, we are looking to develop and publish a model remedial orders handbook for Asia and the Pacific, which will include selected orders from key environment and climate cases, and, which can be used by judges to generate ideas about appropriate remedies um, and, and, of course, tailored for their legal system and national context. So uh, in addition to um, strengthening the capacity of the judges, um, there is also um, a need to put in sufficient environment and climate change legal frameworks. And, and Georgie and, uh, and also John Philippe, um, you know, highlighted this earlier. Um, and, and also to increase access, to, um, you know, increase mechanisms to increase access to the courts, for example, environmental rules of procedure. So our research shows that, you know, environmental law litigation is limited um, in South Asian countries for these types of reasons. So again, uh, lack of, lack of or efficient um, legal frameworks or laws. Um, there's also strict rules of standing which inhibit access to the courts by the public. Um, and also um, there's greater reliance on administrative measures and um, rights-based litigation is still nascent uh, in many Southeast Asian countries. Um, and so I, you know, I guess Cambodia is another example, but we, we looked at Cam we looked at Cambodia just because we're working with them. Um, you know, when, um, for example, you know, in Cambodia, plaintiffs want to um, bring suit a climate action suit, um, and and there's no um, climate change law right now. So you know, they can rely on the constitution, um, which basically says that you know the petitioner can only sue when there is a breach of law. Uh, but because there is no law. Um, it, it's challenging for citizens to demonstrate a violation of, of the law because there isn't any. Um, so in these types of situations, it would be helpful to have um, environmental, special environmental rules of procedure, which, you know, which can contain um, provisions to address the standing issue and um, also have um, procedures to, for public interest litigation. Um, where actually, you know, if you compare that to Indonesia and the Philippines, um, they actually, um, in comparison to um, Cambodia, they have the most active environmental litigation in Southeast Asia. Um, and um, actually uh, case law from actually landmark case de uh, decisions, um, courts have uh, relaxed the rules of standing. And then later on, they've, um, you know, put in place uh, regulations to grant standing um, to citizens in public interest litigation. Um, and, and I mentioned this before that, you know, there's greater reliance on administrative measures, um, for example, in Thailand and Vietnam, but that's, um, you know, in terms of standing, um, 
I think uh, it's it's easier to establish um, the causal link um, and and direct impact, but the remedies are really inadequate. Um, so the, the downside of um, administrative uh, measures is 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 just it's just not sufficient um, either. Um, so you know what are we um, you know doing about um, you know strengthening the, about increasing access to the courts. Um, so you know, many some of you may know that ADB. Um, you know, we've we've been working with judges for over ten years, actually since two thousand ten, and uh, we've been partnering with various courts in Asia and the Pacific to assist in more effective adjudication of environmental cases, and um, more recently, the complex climate change cases. Um, so we commenced this work with the judges because we realized their critical role in inclusive and sustainable development, um, and we noticed that while you know. Uh, donor funds and you know other resources are being put to laws um, and enforcement measures with environmental agencies judges were you know sometimes being overlooked but without them you know it's difficult to uphold the rule of law so without skilled judges um, prosecutions and litigation will fail and um, also result in inadequate remedies um, so in particular, we work with apex courts, such as Supreme Courts and Chief Justices, because um, their buy-in and support is critical to disseminating the important messages and institutionalizing the, uh, the traditional curriculums. Um, so over the last decade, um, various courts um, in uh, Asia and the Pacific had made significant progress um, by working together with ADB and, and with other development partners, uh, such as UNEP. Um, they've established green benches and courts judicial certification programs for environment and promulgated environmental rules of procedure um another um important i i I'm, I'm i'm just going to interrupt because if sure. i do want to go back we have shan philippe as well and i do want sure. to get some questions and as well christina I'll wrap so up if, if yeah if you would just mind uh wrapping up and then we sure. move on so so basically another important um, component of that is really the network that uh, we helped create it that um, it's still being supported by all the development partners so uh, in conclusion you know it's it's critical um you know to support um the judges um because of their critical importance in obviously um you know in access to justice issues but really the sustainable development outcome so thank you so much for this opportunity i'll hand it over to john Philly. thank you okay christina thanks a million for that you've raised a lot yeah. of very interesting issues which we will tease out and and actually we've we've since got a comment from ernst jorgensen thank you very much who's been watching online and he says a key challenge in relation to the judiciary in cambodia is also the lack of independence in cambodia he says the ruling party completely dominates the legislative and judicial branches. We may get comments from, from you all on that. Jean-Philippe, um, Christina, so thank you very much. Jean-Philippe, very good to not just see that you're back online, but we can see you this time around. So um, I don't know what happened there, but if you can pick up the train of thought that you had and continue with your presentation, that would be great. Now, we can't uh, hear you, so can you unmute, or Charlotte can perhaps you make sure Jean-Philippe is unmuted. Thank you. So thank you very much. I'm really sorry for this uh, problem, but uh, unfortunately, sometimes networks are capricious. Then uh, I was I was talking uh, about the, the sources of environmental law. Uh, this um, uh, number of sources are uh, is a huge difficulties for judges and prosecutors because to uh, to make law efficient, to enforce law, you need to know the law. That's something pretty obvious for everyone, but in environmental law, this is a huge difficulty. Just, I can now show you our code uh, for env our environment, which is a, a huge Bible, but um, for judges here in France and prosecutors, but unfortunately in France, the environmental law doesn't derive only from the, 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 the specialized code, it derives from 15 other codes, the criminal code, the civil code, the labor codes, and so many other codes. So that it's, first of all, if we took, especially through the Arras Convention, um, access of the people of the civil society to environmental and to justice, environmental justice, 
first of all, the first obstacle is the access of judges and prosecutors to environmental law. So that it means that we have a huge work in, in, this, uh, in this way. Uh, then, um, what do we talk about when we um, talk on environmental law? From the judges and prosecutors' side, uh, we talk on criminal environmental law, trafficking of species, trafficking of waste, sea pollution, uh, deforestation, climate justice, and so many other topics. It means that uh, we are, fa we are uh, in facing a very wide scope, which make once more um, the access of judges and prosecutors pretty difficult to this uh, law. Uh, we talk also on civil law, on e ecological damages. How do we assess ecological damages? That's a huge problem. We talk on insurance. We talk on corporate, on green finance, on labor law, on environmental public health. That's very important because there is a huge connection between environmental law and the uh, human health. That's a huge topic and a very interesting one. And, and usually when we talk on environmental law, environmental health law, we can motivate judges and prosecutors to improve their knowledge in the field of environmental law. That's a, 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 a huge, an important track for us in France to train prosecutors. This leads me to talk on the training of judges and prosecutors, which is uh, one of, I'm sorry, because I'm facing the sun now in, in Paris, so that um, uh, this is, one of the most, uh, one of the very important way uh, that we are discussing with or the European Commission uh, in Brussels, the training of judges and prosecutors uh, through national school for the judiciary, national academies of judges and or prosecutors. In France, we have only one school which is located in Bordeaux for both prosecutors and judges. Uh, we need uh, to improve uh, the training of judges and prosecutors. And in France, in Europe in general, that's um, um, very important. And we have a very, very, very huge work to do because uh, judges and prosecutors, especially in France, uh, have a very poor knowledge in this field. And we cannot uh, ensure effectiveness on environmental law if judges and prosecutors are not trained in that field. So that I think it could be a good track for all of you in uh, Southeast Asia to, uh, to, to, to develop uh, this uh, training session for judges and prosecutors as well, and that's, that's very important as well, as police forces. Uh, because especially in criminal law, the investigation of criminal units are absolutely essential. And if we do not train uh, police forces, uh, through police academies and connected with prosecutors, um, I think that uh, we cannot succeed in our so important mission. Uh, in France, and I will close my, my, my presentation with that, in France, uh, we, are, we have um, reached recently a new step because the, 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 the lawmakers passed a few months ago a new law, uh, and this new law has created 36 regional units uh, are spread all over the territory in Europe, in, 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 and as well as in the overseas territories, like New Caledonia, which is not so far away of, our, of your position today. Um, which we have in the law, the, the lawmaker has uh, decided to implement 36 regional units specialized in uh, environmental law, mainly criminal law and for part civil law as well. Uh, so that these units are supposed to, um, to, be, uh, to be created with uh, dedicated prosecutors, dedicated uh, judges that our National School for the Judiciary uh, will train within the next few weeks and months. I think that uh, that's absolutely essential because uh, in France, as everywhere, we have uh, many, um, we have a lot of uh, green criminality, 
but prosecutions are very weak. Uh, investigations, criminal investigations are pretty weak as well. And the, the cases are rarely brought uh, by criminal courts, for example. And uh, we need to let the, the, the French authorities are pretty aware of that. And that's the reason why these specific units have been created. We will see how uh, we will success or not, uh, because this is a law and a newly passed law, and we have a lot of work to implement these units uh, in France. Okay. So, uh, if you can just very quickly finish up, Jean Philippe, just, that would be. I, I just need one minute. So that um, judges and prosecutors will be trained. And uh, the question uh, which was put to the, uh, to the decision maker, uh, do, 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 will we uh, establish green courts, dedicated green courts and separated green courts of other courts, like in other country? I noticed that, for example, in some Asian country, there are some uh, green courts sep separated of ordinary, of ordinary courts. And in front, they have decided not to separate the, 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 the judges and prosecutors dedicated to environment, but to include uh, specific sections in ordinary courts and prosecution services uh, to, uh, to, to her, to her sp specific uh, cases and to make a decision. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you okay. for your heart. I think we have a huge work to do. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jean-Philippe, and, and it does sound like you have a significant challenge ahead in trying to ensure judges are trained up, environmental laws, the framework is adapted, uh, significant challenges. Thank you all for your very, very good expert opinions. You've raised a lot of issues. We've about 20 minutes or so to maybe take some questions, so put some questions to you all. You can keep your microphones unmuted unless there's a lot of background noise. Um, Georgina, if I can go back to you then, um, because you made some very good points about constitutional rights and, and, and making sure things are in the constitution. But we also heard from Christina, you know, a, a variety of different maybe experiences. She mentioned in particular Indonesia and the Philippines, if I'm correct, uh, Christina is saying maybe the situation is better there. So Georgina, back to you. C can you just give us an overview of the status of climate justice in the in, in the southeast uh, asian region you know and and are some what countries potentially need more help than others yeah thank you uh i i think there are two elements here and just picking up on both what christina and jean philippe were saying um there are now uh, greater expectations on judges and judges are being asked to play an increasing role in addressing climate injustice um, and partly that's because, uh, as Christina was saying, more cases are being brought to the courts to address climate injustice. Um, but there is also, uh, despite the limitations of um, judicial capacity in environmental law, there is an increasing body of, of jurisprudence um, around climate litigation. Uh, and in the, this region, there is an increasing trend of rights-based climate litigation and adjudication that is seeking to require governments to fulfill their climate commitments and protect the rights of citizens impacted by climate change. Um, it, there is not as much climate litigation as other parts of the world, but it is increasing. Um, and, and UNEP has found that globally there are increasing numbers of cases that are relying on fundamental and human rights that are enshrined in international laws and national constitutions that compel climate action. So having these constitutional rights, which you were referencing, Karen, is very important. And in addition to the, the countries that I mentioned that do have a constitutional right uh, to a healthy environment, there is a right to a healthy environment found within the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration as well. Um, and of course, importantly, happening right now at the Human Rights Council is a proposed resolution to globally recognize a human right to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. And it's likely that that uh, global recognition will spur further recognition at the national level across the region. 
Um, and, and I just want to quickly mention that ADB has also done a lot of work in this area and recent research by ADB, they have a series, a publication that is um, climate litigation coming to a court near you, uh, which has found that one third of all climate litigation outside the United States hinges on fundamental human and constitutional rights. But just, uh, Georgina, on the point about, you know, you're saying there is a, a, a rise in, in climate litigation, but we also know, and we mentioned it at the beginning, and I think you may have referenced it again, that it is the most disadvantaged people in these regions very often who are the most affected, who are the most vulnerable, and they don't have, in many cases, the resources, the financial resources, and perhaps the, the access to education to understand what the laws are. So how do they, the people who are most affected, how do they get to understand and, and get to be able to use the, the, their fundamental rights in terms of international laws to take cases at a local level? Yeah, one of the critical elements here is, of course, building that capacity. Uh, and EHRD, so environmental human rights defenders and community uh, or civil society organizations and NGOs play a really vital role in ensuring the protection of local communities and marginalized groups' rights to a safely and healthy and sustainable environment. And the, one of the big challenges in this region is that the space for environmental human rights defenders and CSOs remains incredibly limited. So one of the critical needs is actually supporting uh, those organizations and those individuals and promoting and protecting civic space. Uh, and this is another really critical element of these procedural access rights alongside access to justice, uh, access to information and public participation are essential. And so UNEF works a lot with um, environmental human rights defenders uh, to, to support them and provide that enabling safe environment. Coming back to the law though, one of the really critical things is providing legal protection of environmental human rights defenders. Um, and in other regions, the Escazoo uh, is really important in Latin America and the Caribbean in providing that enabling environment for local communities and environmental human rights defenders to, to access justice. There's a lot of calls increasingly in Southeast Asia to look to a similar mechanism, a regional mechanism like Ahus and particularly like Escazú. Um, and, and so that is one thing. So having a regional framework, working towards regional framework, but increasing at the national level, legal protection for EHRDs and for civil society um, so that they can stand up and seek access to justice without threats uh, against them. Okay, thank you so much for that, Georgina. Maybe just on that point, if I go to you, Jean-Philippe, because you talked about the environmental frameworks, that huge book that you showed us and, you know, the difficulties of being able to come up maybe, and I am not a legal person, so, so please, you, you, you know, make this clearer for us, a sort of a simple framework that can apply globally. Um, if you take the points that Georgina made, how then, how, how can we get a system going where it you know it can be easily applied to different countries in this instance within the southeast asia region so uh, I, first of all i think that in uh, I, I i know pretty well uh, southeast asia uh, I, I went many times for missions in environmental law in vietnam in the philippines etc and and i'm i know that the first obstacle in southeast asia is how the, the lawmakers is elaborating the laws because it's very different between such and such country. So uh, I think that in some countries, I have some ideas, but I, I will not focus on such or such country. I, I, have, I will only make general observation. I know that in some, some countries, there are not environmental code. Uh, there are um, many, many separated laws which are not very logical, which are not articulated. And uh, first of all, I think that in the countries in, in your area over there in Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia is a key area for environment issues, environmental issues, on my view. Eh? So that's, uh, I think that 
uh, uh, all the countries over there, uh, the governments, public authorities should assess which tools, which legal tools they have, and, and, and to improve then uh, the courts, the laws, etc. That's the first step, on my view, to make environmental law effective, e efficient. That's, that's necessary. But I know that there are many, many different situations in Southeast Asia, depending on political reasons, uh, legal history reasons as well. That's the first point. Uh, then I do share your views when you say that in some uh, um, tribunals uh, there is a lack of resources. That's true. We have we are facing the same question here, even if sometimes it's easier. Uh, but um, uh, we cannot improve the, the 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 knowledge of judges and prosecutors if this legal framework is not uh, is not. Um, harmonized you see and why then uh, this is a question of internal law but and this is another uh, uh, problem for me uh, why do we need to harmonize because uh, for example in, in the field of international green crime uh, international trafficking of waste of an endangered species we need to improve the cooperation between prosecutors and investigation units we cannot investigate uh, a case of a traffic international trafficking of waste departing from france over i don't know india or, uh, or Cambodia, for example, is the only example, if prosecutors from both sides cannot connect and on the same legal base. That's absolutely mandatory. Because I was, I, I was a, a prosecutor, a, a, what we say in France, a Liaison prosecutor, so that it means prosecutors posted abroad. I was posted three years in Brazil, so that I used to, to talk on international uh, criminal cooperation that's very with Brazil it works very well with France but I know uh, in Brazil they are facing very very important environmental topics of course you know so that but uh, okay. uh, we could talk all together and we, we need to, to harmonize legislations um, also to improve the, the discussions and the context with prosecutors all over the world that's the key issue Okay, very good, Jean-Philippe. Um, and I want to go to you now, Christina, as well. Before I do, I'll just read out a comment from another one of our uh, viewers online. Kwasiya, thank you so much for your comment. Enacting necessary law and regulations matters, says uh, Kwa. Uh, knowing them also matters. As Jean-Philippe has pointed out, effectiveness of these laws and regulations are equally important. The focus should be placed on the aspect of effectiveness as well as educating the public. Well, on that point of education, I want to go to you, Christina, something you mentioned several times in, in your own um, presentation there about the, ver the need to educate the judges and the prosecutors. Jean-Philippe is talking about the harmonization of, of legal frameworks. Um, is that possible? It sounds like it's very challenging. Um, to get the kind of level of training and education broadly across Southeast Asia. But, but is that possible? And if so, how? Karen, I think your sound has gone off <clears throat> for some reason. Oh. Uh, I don't know if you're able to put it back. Um, OK. Can you hear me now? It's OK. Yes. OK. Can you hear me now? Can, if, if maybe, uh, Christina, can you nod if you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. But, but Christina, we, we, your sound is muted. Okay. Christina, I'm sorry. Did you hear my question? And if so, if you can unmute yourself, please. And if not, I can yeah, repeat sorry the about question. That. But if yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I, heard, I heard the question. Uh, so basically, um, I think the question um, uh, was asking about whether harmonization uh, of uh, laws are possible in Southeast Asia region and how, how that could be achieved. Um, I, I think that's one of the you know um, reasons um, that we work with on a regional basis as well, like a sub-regional basis. So we do a lot of uh, knowledge sharing among um, the ASEAN, just ASEAN um, judges. And we recently started working with the um, 
ASEAN Council Chief Justices, and um, they're also interested in harmonization. But I think you know it relates to um, sharing of best practices and judgments. And in a subregion such as ASEAN, um, I do think that harmonization can be possible to a certain extent. Um, um, but um, it's really by sharing the judgments, um, obviously the laws and the best practices. It, it, it can be possible, but really it depends on what we're talking about, what, why we're trying to harmonize and what type of laws um, that we're trying to harmonize. But I think what can be taken is best uh, practices in the region that can be shared. Um, maybe through that uh, process, their harmonization can be possible through regional knowledge sharing, and then um, which will flow down to the decision making and, and the laws. And, and, uh, and Christina as well, what about um, one of you, I don't know now whether it was yourself or Jean-Philippe mentioned police forces, because presumably, you know, you, ha you need to have the governments educated in this, you need to have the lawyers, the judges, but police surely and security forces are also a key component of ensuring all those players understand their obligations. How, how do you go about doing that? Christina, did you hear that? Or Okay, Georgina, I don't know if you heard that question. I'm not sure, Christina. Yes, I Maybe. heard that. I mean, one of the critical things that we've started looking at uh, in environmental crime is the need to look across the entire enforcement chain. Uh, in order to deter and disrupt environment, I mean, this is specifically looking at environmental crime, but you have to um, train the environment enforcement officials. You have to train customs agents, the prosecutors and, and the judges, and they need to, all of those groups across the enforcement chain need to be interacting and speaking uh, with each other because often they, they are operating somewhat in silos. Um, and we found when we looked specifically at illegal waste trade and we conducted a, a training that actually brought European and Asian enforcement officials together. And we brought uh, the enforcement chain at the national level together. Um, then there was a lot of light bulb moments in sort of understanding from prosecutors what types of evidence uh, they needed to have collected and understanding um, all these different elements of, of why certain cases are not brought uh, to prosecution and of why certain, um, you know, why there were certain outcomes and, and there was a lot of um, need to exchange. So it's very important. I completely agree with, with Jean-Philippe that um, all of these different elements of the enforcement chain need to be trained. Um, and is there the political will across the board to do what is required now maybe christina did you just nod if you heard my question there because i'm not sure yeah is, yeah, is there I, I the political will is there a growing political will across the region uh to um, to now try and do something about this i i think so um so we've been uh, we just kicked off the next uh, phase of our tech judicial technical assistance program and we've been uh, consulting various governments um, first with the Ministry of Justice and of course the court authorities and and the demand has been huge um, especially on environment and climate change dispute resolution um, so I think that kind of shows how important these issues are to their development priorities so they have been um, very receptive to our technical assistance. And in fact, we've gotten um, a lot of requests across the board um, and just going, and we're also trying to work on a sub-regional, a regional basis as well, like through ASEAN um, to ensure that um, this, uh, you know, capacity building is built in and basically institutionalized and, and um, made part of, uh, part of um, the judicial, regular judicial education program, um, given the significant development impacts. Okay, thank you very much, Jan Philippe. Maybe final word to you again about whether you think you see a sea change in terms of political will across the board to try and really get, you know, a, a proper environmental law framework, get the police on board, get the judges trained, etc., to to try and improve that whole situation of access to environmental and climate justice. Jan Philippe, sorry, you'll have to unmute your mic. Can you unmute your mic? Okay, team, can you unmute Jean Philippe's mic for us? Uh, oh, um, no, no, I'm. Oh, 
Oh my God. Uh, actually, we, oh, you, okay. you're okay. You, <laughs> so, you, can start, uh, you can start again. Just start again, again with your answer. Thank you. Yeah. So I was saying that, and that I'm now fighting with sun, but it's a good thing. So it's not good for, for the climate. So uh, uh, my, my final words would be that, uh, uh, first of all, thank you once again for this conference because the international cooperation is absolutely crucial to make some progresses. And I'm sure that UNEP, uh, ADB, etc., uh, have a, a prominent role in, in, in the field of uh, harmonizing the legislation and improving inter in international cooperation. Uh, myself and my association, which, which is a newly association, uh, newly created association, so that we are a baby just right now. Uh, we are uh, available uh, within the next world or next, next month to, to help you if we can with our uh, means uh, to, in, in this way to improve the legal cooperation, maybe to assess some legislations and uh, uh, because our, by helping our uh, Asian colleagues, we will help ourselves as well. That's very important. Cooperation is from both sides. Well, look, thank you so much for a very, very interesting uh, discussion and incredibly important as well as, and as you say, it's not just uh, for the region itself, it's for everybody and those of us here in Europe and other continents as well. I want to say a big thanks to our wonderful three speakers for taking the time and the efforts into their presentations. To Georgina Lloyd, thank you. Georgina Jean-Philippe, thank you so much. Jean-Philippe Riveau, and to you, Christina Pack, thank you very, very much. Thanks to all of you who submitted questions. Sorry, we ran out of time. We couldn't get to all of them. But I want to hand back now to my fellow moderator, Rene, Rene Wintham, who's going to take you through uh, the final conclusion. Over to you, Rene. And thank you, Karen. And can I add to that a very, very big thank you to you as well. This is a first for us. We haven't worked together on a conference together like this, and it's been real blast. It's been fantastic. So thank you very much. And again, also to all your very qualified speakers. It's been a very rousing discussion. In fact, all of the roundtables have been superb. Uh, sadly, unfortunately, we come to the end of our conference, so I've been asked to pull together some of the points that we've gleaned from our brilliant speakers as we look towards the future and what we've learned at our conference. But before we do, I sometimes think that the best way of encouraging people to uh, prevent climate change is not just to tell them to use less water, to be careful of plastics, to use less energy, to fly by plane less, to drive less, to create less waste and all those familiar messages. But we, I would rather approach it from a more positive angle. So just bear with me for a moment, Where, wherever you are at home, sitting in your office somewhere quiet, looking forward to lunch, for a moment, just close your eyes and for a minute, visualize what deep down all of us in Europe in Southeast Asia and on this planet really want to happen. Everyone really, and this is much more positive than the negatives. We all want a world where the air is pure and unpolluted. Water is clean, pure and crystal clear. Fish are thriving. Birds fly peacefully. Our fields are filled with produce not sprayed with pesticides. Our tasty food is grown in healthy soil, which thrives. Insects and wildlife flourish and multiply. We delight in bathing in the greenery of our forests and the clean waters of our rivers, lakes and seas. Our streets are filled with people walking and cycling in safety. And there's only the gentle hum of nature, no noisy traffic. Our cities are filled with trees and plants, and there's no more hunger or poverty. At night, wherever we are in the world, we can look up at the sky and see how brightly the stars shine. So now open your eyes and we'll slowly round off the conference, but at least we have a vision. 
I've been asked to pull things together, so I hope you can stay with me just for a bit longer before you rush to your lunch and try and stay lively. <clears throat> so over the past two days of our virtual conference simultaneously in Southeast Asia and in Europe, we've consolidated the commitment of the Agence France de Développement, the AFD, working with ASEAN to ensure sustainable development, especially to mitigate climate change and encourage biodiversity in Southeast Asia, under the terms agreed in Paris at COP25, and looking towards COP26 in Glasgow in Scotland in November. For the past year, the AFD has achieved the status of partnership with the ASEAN group of countries, enabling them all to work together. France is still feeling her feet, finding out the best way to cooperate and work with ASEAN. Our speakers have considered how the Agence Française de Développement can continue to play an active role with ASEAN countries in averting what could be a dramatic climate change. This could harm biodiversity, force millions of people to leave their homes for good and threaten human and animal life. Southeast Asia is particularly exposed to climate hazards and environmental degradation. All countries in Southeast Asia are far from equal. It's vital that the poorest nations are not made to suffer disproportionately to the rich ones. And of course, COVID has brought new unexpected problems, especially in sanitation and the economy. This has added greatly to the factors which the AFD have had to deal with over these since COVID started. Yesterday in the plenary, we heard a cheering example in Phnom Penh where the support of the AFD to those on the ground has improved water sanitation dramatically over the past two decades. While the AFD is supporting economic growth across the region, it's sensitive to the importance of preserving biodiversity and working to fulfill the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. You're all familiar with them. They were adopted in 2015, but I'll just give you a little refresher as we draw to the conclusion of our conferences, a sort of checklist. So in a nutshell, the UN Sustainable Development Goals are as follows. <clears throat> no poverty, no hunger, good health and well-being for all, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced financial inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, respons responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water and life on land, peace, justice and strong institutions and partnerships for the sustainable development goals. So these goals are at the forefront of the work of the AFD and ASEAN. So let's now look at a resume of some of the points that we've majored on in the last two days during our conference. In the first round table yesterday, the discussion was on finance and how ASEAN and the AFD cooperate. Of course, however idealistic one is about improving infrastructure and mitigating climate change, it often comes down to how much money is available and where to allocate it fairly, what kind of obstacles there are and how agreements are reached, which projects are being developed and what plans there are for financing projects in the future. <clears throat> the second round table focused on energy and the transition to renewables. Fossil fuels are still widely used in Southeast Asia. Some of the infrastructure is very old. Managing the transition away from fossil fuel dependency needs deep consideration and investment. A moratorium on coal would make the transition to green energy all the more uh, urgent. It's not just energy, but also in the construction industry and all aspects of the energy sector, but the transition to renewable energy needs to be swift and effective. 
And it also means that both the private and the public sector need to cooperate and investment is once more vital. As it was pointed out, we just need one clear roadmap to transitioning. At the moment, many things were put forward, but we need the one clear roadmap. The ETP, the Energy Transition Partnership, was formed in November 2020. It operates under the UN flag and it's hoped it'll become widely known and respected. And this will help make the transition to renewables easier and swifter. It has plans to approach governments and philanthropic organizations to raise more funds. Currently, it's the philanthropic organizations which are contributing the major part. Raising awareness will include showing its profile at COP26 in Glasgow this November, with the aim of acquiring more funding. Among the aims of the ETP are how to end the use of coal, work on batteries and storage, and other energy efficiency programs. In our third roundtable, we looked at the pressures on the Mekong River and Mekong Delta as developing economy, economies compete with existing biodiversity. There are more and more demands on the Mekong, but the Mekong River Commission, the MCR, is working hard to balance these in the face of climate change. We saw how the MCR is helping to preserve biodiversity and ensure good water management in the face of new dams being built, which threaten wetlands and water supplies. Looking to the future, how can the Mekong River Commission and also Intergovernmental Planet on Climate Change work towards ensuring that the Mekong remains safe with its biodiversity intact and yet ensure it can still be a pillar of the economy? Some positive solutions were put forward, which we hope will be put into practice. We were encouraged to think not just about human rights, but equally about the rights of nature and also about the rights of rivers. Our fourth and last round table just now looked at fairness and justice for all the countries of Southeast Asia, climate justice, how individual rights and community rights can be protected in the face of climate change and how poorer communities can have their voices heard as they strive to prevent the degradation of their environment. How can corruption be avoided? How can magistrates fairly enforce standards and assure that each individual country conforms to these standards? <clears throat> the importance of training the judges and the police came out in the discussion, and um, they need to know far more about environmental law and, put it in, uh, and its importance and also put nature in the forefront. And although people may try to circumvent the law, this should be far stronger and more enforceable than it is at the moment. Hearing from our quali highly qualified speakers, it's been a fabulous range. I've enjoyed every single one of them. Um, it leaves us feeling hopeful that with AFD and ASEAN, where there's a will, there's a way. If the Southeast Asian countries pull together to take the issue seriously and help poorer nations, and if they use more sustainable sources of energy, there is still time and hope. It's important to keep raising awareness of the value of biodiversity and to make sure the whole management of the area is properly inspected and controlled. We've heard some excellent ideas over the past two days, but we also need efficiency and monitoring to make sure these ideas are carried out properly. We need fairness to help poorer nations have equal support. And we need great speed because time is running out. We need to learn to value nature above all else, just in case we have forgotten it over the past couple of centuries. We are part of nature. We need to value nature with far more reverence than we value money and material goods today. But after hearing from our raft of knowledgeable speakers, I'm feeling more optimistic than at the start of the conference. The key issue that seemed to have been mentioned again and again by many of our speakers in different uh, sessions is funding. The will to transition is there. The awareness for protecting nature is strong. The ideas are exciting and plentiful. 
but the go above all these require governments to cooperate and money and investment. But again and again, our speakers emphasized awareness and respect for nature. Well, now it's time to end this inspiring confidence with a wish that the AFD and ASEAN will combine to continue their hard work towards bringing all these ideas that came out today to fruition. Thanks to you, the audience listening at home. Uh, I'm sure you're hungry, but you've been very good to hold out, both in Southeast Asia and in Europe, and maybe elsewhere too. Also, thanks so much to our highly qualified speakers who brought so much life and wisdom to our discussions. Huge thanks to my colleague, Karen Coleman of Moderators Europe, who's always a great joy to work with, but never hand in hand like this, it's been great. Also, thanks to the AFD team who've been so supportive, helpful and conscientious, including Yazid Ben Zaid, Charlotte Le Leo, Louise Marchand, Christine Auger, and so many invisible people like backstage moderators, organizers, trainers from Livestorm, AFD, ASEAN, MRC, IUCN, and a <coughs> raft of other very helpful people. I would especially like to thank the skilled technicians working silently, without whom this conference would not have appeared on our computers. It's been a terrific two days, and I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. We're leaving feeling hopeful and inspired, and let's hope this feeling continues at COP26 in Glasgow in November. I bet they can't have as good speakers as we've had on our conference, but you never know. So, from Bangkok, France, Ireland, and everywhere else in Southeast Asia and Europe, keep living in hope. I'm Rini Windham. Goodbye from me, but that's not quite the end. To round off the entire conference successfully, who better than Yazid Ben Said, the regional director for the Agence Française de Développement, the AFD in Southeast Asia. A very, very warm welcome back to you, Yazid. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. And um, well, who wants better? I think all the speakers better than me. But uh, anyway, dear, dear, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to close this conference. And thank you very much, Renee, for your brilliant summary, uh, which uh, I think inspires us for the, for the future. Well, I think like all of you, it has been a real pleasure for me to listen to all these rich and exciting interventions over the last two days. To all the speakers, you have provided, I think, a precise and multifaceted insight into development challenges in Southeast Asia. And I thank you very much for taking the time to share your experiences and to discuss these crucial issues. Of course, um, I will join my uh, thanks that uh, Rene you just mentioned, but I would particularly like to acknowledge the participations of ADB, ASEAN and the ASEAN Center for Energy, the European Union, UNSCAP, PPWSA, or historical partner in Phnom Penh, also OTP, MRC, IUCN, and UNEP, who are all strong partners of AFD in Southeast Asia. But also the participation of Carl Middleton and Jean-Philippe Rivo today for their expert vision. Uh, to you also, dear uh, listeners, I thank you for having followed these two days of discussions and for having enriched them with your questions, which were always relevant. You have joined us from all over Europe and Southeast Asia, with strong representations from international organizations and donors and civil society as well. I hope that you have enjoyed this conference and that it has, it has shed light on the problems facing Southeast Asia, but also, and I would say above all, on the solutions that exist, which was the main result expected from this conference. For those who missed any of the sessions, you will receive a Livestorm replay link and the different sessions will be posted soon on IFD's YouTube page. We also publish an article in the next few weeks on our website to summarize the main conclusion of these two days of exchange, even which I invite you to consult this uh, conclusion, even if uh, René, of course, has already brought the first conclusions to a close. And thank you also, René, for uh, having helped us to dream to a better future. Um, I won't keep you any longer. As you mentioned, it's, uh, it's time uh, uh, for lunch for those who are based in Europe. It's also time for, I would say, for the weekend for those who are, who are in Southeast Asia. But uh, allow me also two more words 
first want to thank very warmly my two colleagues, Louise and Charlotte, without forgetting my Parisian colleagues, without whom this conference could not have been held. So thank you and congratulations to you, dear colleagues. It was a challenge and, uh, and I think you really did it. And of course, thank you very much, René and Karen, for having led the debates. Sometimes technical, I understand that it was not for, uh, always your uh, cup of tea, I would say. Uh, but you have uh, uh, led the debates in a lively and informative way for all. Thank you for the synthesis, René, of the conference that allows us to believe, I would say, reasonably in the future if we act together, if we act correctly, and if we act quickly. Even if the challenges are important and do remain, but we know, we know that. And that is the first step to be able to address them in the future. And to hear all what you say, I can say that it was a rich conference providing constructive ideas that we still have to apply on the ground. It was the case in particular today with the three very well uh, good uh, uh, round tables. And this is a good opportunity to meet soon again, hopefully. So thanks again to all of you for your participation and uh, I would say happy end of day wherever you are in the world. Thank you all and the conference is over. See you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>